If you want to learn Red Hat Linux and Scent OS, it gets no easier than this. You get four plus hours of HD video in depth showing you exactly how to learn Red Hat Linux and Scent OS, all of which you can do for free with minimal modifications to your current system. Ermin and I teach this course together. Ermin will start you off explaining why you might want to learn Linux. Irma will show you how to download and install Linux, how to create a virtual machine with VirtualBox, how to dual boot Red Hat, and then you'll get basic familiarization with the Linux graphical user interface, and then deep into the Linux command line until you've then spent over four hours in the video. This is a complete, free, comprehensive tutorial for Linux with Red Hat Linux and Scent OS, created in 2015 for you to learn it for free right here. This is part of an even bigger course on Udemy that has 14 hours of HD video. You're getting the first four hours of the course right here on YouTube for free. If you have any questions, the only way to ask Ermin questions and to get answers is to take this course on Udemy because this is my YouTube channel and I'm the marketing guy. So if you want to ask Ermin questions, you take the course on Udemy. You don't have to pay $1.99 to take the course. You go to my website, jerrybanfield.com slash Udemy. I'm the marketing guy. As I said, I teach 30 plus courses on Udemy and one of them is this course you're looking at now. You can get a $25 coupon here. Once you click on that link, then you'll get this. You'll see a $25 coupon. And you just click the blue button to take this course. Before I pass you over to Ermin, there's a couple of quick things you'll want to know about this video. Since it's four plus hours long, you'll want to be able to check various points and see what all the video contains. The easiest way to do that this is on another video and the video you're looking at will look similar. You scroll down and look at show more. Once you're at show more, you've got the link to my website along with a direct link to the course on Udemy. And then what you've got below, you have a timeline with points you can click on. You can click on any of the points on the timeline on this video to skip ahead to a certain section if you want to. Or if you didn't get something you want to look back, you can skip back to it. This is a long video, so if you want to save this for later, you can add it to a playlist, you can share it, or if you like it, it'll be added to your liked videos and you can go back and find it that way. Thank you very much for watching this video with Ermin and I. Ermin will now explain to you why Linux is worth learning. Hello everybody. Today I want to give a bit of an addition. Today I want to create an addition to the introduction and I do believe that this will be of great use to you. Even though there's nothing technical in this tutorial, uh, there is a bit of a motivation embedded into it. Basically here I want to deal with the subject why should anybody learn how to use Linux or why should anybody learn how to use Red Hat or get their certification or anything of a kind. Well. Here's why. You might think, you might have this idea that most of the world runs either on Windows or on Mac, but that is simply not the case. Uh, if you just take a look at Google, at Facebook, at Twitter, at eBay, at PayPal, uh, all these servers all these companies they pretty much completely run on Linux I'm not sure about eBay but like 99% sure that it runs on Linux as well all of these companies they are the biggest companies one of the biggest companies on the planet and they all run on Linux all of their machines are Linux all of their servers are running Linux and if you want to get a job with any of those companies as a, te as a technical person or anything of a kind you will need to know uh, a lot, a great deal about Linux, because pretty much the entire Google development team, the entire, not the team, the entire Google development platform is actually on a Linux machines, all of it. Even though the employees can bring their own computers into the company that can have any operating system installed on them, 
the main OS which they use as a platform for development is actually Linux. They use a version of Ubuntu that they've adapted to their own needs. Anyway, uh, if, as I said, if you take a look at Facebook as well, all of their servers from beginning till to this till this day on today, they run on Linux. But okay, that might that might still not be enough for you. You might still think, oh well, there is bound to be something else. There is bound to be uh, something more other than those few companies. Well, let me tell you something. All of your Android phones that you have, that you carry in your pockets, or that you uh, see on television or whatever, they all run on Linux as well. Your smart TVs run on Linux. Uh, I don't know what else do you need, basically. Even though the desktop computers, till this day on today, most of the desktop computers do run on Windows, and the market share is pretty low there for Linux. That is nothing. You can just imagine all the Android phones, they run on Linux. All the major companies uh, run on Linux. Pretty much a large, I mean, not all, but certainly a very large portion of servers, like 90% of them in the world, run on Linux-based systems. Uh, your routers, all, pretty much all routers, they run on Linux as well. Be it your home router or your Cisco router, or they don't necessarily need to run directly on Linux, but they run on a derivative of a Linux. Uh, Cisco routers, Juniper routers, uh, the commands on the Juniper router are pretty much the same as within a Linux terminal. The environment is very similar, that's fantastic for me, and for a lot of people out there. And even, till the, and even the desktop is slowly being taken over by Linux more so in the recent years than in the past. Why so? Well, first of all, it's completely free. Most of it, anyway. If you want to, in certain cases, only if you want support, you pay. Only if you want, like, professional support or something of a kind, then you pay for that support, you subscribe or something of a kind. But the, op the operating system, in and of itself, is free. You just go onto the net, download it, and run it. That's one of the reasons. The second reason is, Although this might not be the, the case to the greatest of extents with Windows 8.1, uh, Windows is, uh, well not Windows, but sorry, Linux is generally far more secure than any Windows or Mac based operating system. Why? Well, one of the main, one of the main reasons I suppose is the fact that it's uh, less used for desktop, so therefore there is less interest to develop viruses and something of a kind. However, that is not the only case for it. I mean, okay, yeah, true, there are, are pre there are pretty much no viruses out there for a Linux-based operating system. Uh, there are a few antivirus systems for it, but they're generally not used, primarily because the system itself is very secure. So even if you were to download a virus as a regular user from the net or something of a kind, to install anything, you require root privileges. So it, even even though it's sitting there on your computer, it won't be able to do anything. Uh, security is a major portion is a major part of Linux. You won't have any problems with viruses. Your system will be very secure, uh, provided of course that you at least configure it properly to a good extent. However desktop users, uh, people who just browse, uh, who use a browser mainly, nothing else pretty much, Windows, uh, actually Linux would be perfect for them, but they tend to use Windows primarily because they are used to it. In Linux, you never have to see the terminal if you do not want to. I use the terminal, people in the business use the terminals always, even desktop users use the terminals primarily because you can get the thing you can get things done a lot faster and the true power uh, rests there in the blessed terminal however if you don't want to as a desktop user you will never have to use it it will not be a requirement but I just wanted to make this a uh, very brief video just to show everybody and explain that most of the world out there is actually, most of the appliances, most of the devices out there in the world, network devices, uh, computers, servers, 
etc. Supercomputers are run on Linux. Pretty much all the supercomputers are run on Linux based operating systems or on the Linux that we know and use in our daily lives today. Plus, as I said, as I mentioned previously, uh, Windows and Mac do cost money to buy while you can do pretty much everything and more with Linux based operating systems without paying a cent. I mean, completely free. Although you will encounter some problems inevitably with applications. For example, Adobe uh, Suit, Adobe Photoshop, or something of a kind will generally not work on Linux. Even with compatibility layer wine, you're going to have problems and it's not going to work there. So in the application section for desktop, uh, it's still lacking a little bit. Also in the in sense of game for gamers. Okay, so Linux is definitely not for gamers. Uh, I mean, if you're an average gamer who doesn't actually require super fast, super performance, like to set everything to max out settings on graphics and stuff like that, you'll be able to run most of the games without any problems on medium settings or something like that. With a compatibility layer, you won't need to download anything specific for Linux. You can just download a Windows game and run it on Linux with Wine without bigger problems. Most of the things will run. Sometimes you will encounter some problems, but most of the time it will run. So those are the, those are the two problems that Linux encounters. But I just wanted to uh, bring this, uh, show this picture to you as I have already stated that most of the world, uh, most of the businesses most of the places where you can get a job, where you can work, they actually run on Linux-based operating systems, banks especially. Maybe not the bank's computers like the one that you see when you walk to the reception, but uh, the infrastructure of the bank, their servers, and the stock market especially. So the stock market in New York, it com the <laughs> pretty much the, the all of the servers there are on a Linux system. And that is what I want to show you, that most of the world runs on Linux, that that is where you can find jobs. I'm not saying that you cannot find jobs with Microsoft or with Windows or something of a kind, but you are far more likely to find something with Linux, even though it's a free operating system because companies do use it. They do need people to actually operate it and to do stuff with it. If you possess that knowledge, you definitely have a better opportunity, a better chance out there to be employed, to find to find work, and to make an income. Aside from that, Linux is highly customizable. There is pretty much nothing that you cannot do, primarily because it's open source, and you get a variety of desktop versions for it. So let's say you want to download Fedora, which is an open source Red Hat free distribution uh, for desktop users. Basically, you can get like a GNOME desktop, or you can get a LXD desktop, or you can get a KDE desktop. Uh, we will get into all of this once we get to the GUI part and all of that. But what I wanted to say is that when you're using Windows or Mac, you're pretty much stuck with one desktop without extensive customization. While on the other hand, with Linux, you can just download the spin that you want. So if you want a KDE spin of Fedora, you just download that one. If you want GNOME spin of Fedora, you just download that one. And you get a completely different desktop. Uh, they differ to a very, very large extent. The user interfaces are completely different, but the terminals are always the same. The terminal commands are always the same. That is why when you're doing something via the terminal, it is a universal way of doing things. It does not vary from one distribution to another to a significant extent. It's pretty much the same everywhere. In any case, uh, if, you're still, if you still have some doubts, feel free to post them in the discussion section. But there is one more thing that I wanted to address in this tutorial, and that is the format for your questions in the discussion section. Now, it would be good if you encounter any errors or any problems during the during this course while you follow it and you're bound to encounter some problems that's normal it happens to everybody uh, you're unable to do something you've installed it on one system the drivers are not uh, you don't have the drivers for that uh, some problems doesn't matter what it is if you're posting it in the discussion uh, just say from which lecture it is copy the error message 
post it there and then explain your problem. Also explain what you have tried to do and the procedure that you have used in order to actually attempt to do that. I do not say this to make my job easier. I just say this to, even though I check the check the discussions on Udemy on daily basis and I try to answer everybody as fast as I possibly can, usually usually within 12 hours, usually everybody gets a response within 12 hours or less. Uh, but you know, when I don't have all the information, I basically have to write an answer, could you please provide an error message or something like that. And then that adds a lot more time and you need to read it and then you need to find the error message again and then you need to post it and then you need to wait for me to check it out again. Basically, you can save yourselves a lot of time by just posting the error message by listing the procedure that you have done and perhaps explaining the setup but most importantly of all say uh, specifying which lecture have uh, which lecture were you following and where did you have where did you encounter the problems so if you just post those things I will be able to provide I will be able to help you a lot better in a far shorter time frame so to say anyway also, in the discussions, do not feel free to ask me about anything related to Linux. There is nothing that is outside of the scope. You can ask pretty much anything. I will be more than happy to pretty much provide any information that I can on pretty much any subject that is related to Linux, either directly or indirectly. In any case, that would be all for now. In the next tutorial, we will get into the stuff. We will actually start doing things. We will get technical and approach without fear. Don't don't let that don't let that stop you or deter you or something of a kind. If you encounter difficulties in the beginning, it's okay. We've all encountered them. Uh, it was difficult for pretty much everybody. If you just stick with it for a little while you will see it gets a lot easier after a certain period of time. I remember when I started using it for the f for the first six months up to a year, I was completely lost, like errors at every corner. But after, after half a year or something like that of using Linux, of playing around with it on my own without any courses, I pretty much felt I started feeling comfortable with it no problems you will do this in a far shorter amount of time because I will introduce you to it step by step and you will see you will become very comfortable with Linux after you have finished this course anyway I'll see you in the next tutorial thank you very much for watching the beginning of this tutorial you just completed the first lecture where there are lots more. You've got so much more to learn and I hope you're motivated to get learning with Linux by now. That's the main point of the course is to get you motivated and inspired to learn Linux. Once you have completed this, now you will get to see how to install Linux with minimal modifications to your operating system. You'll then get the graphical user interface and deeper into the command line. That will take you through four plus hours of this video. If you already know, you've already watched enough to know whether you like listening to Ehrman especially, if you know you like that, then go for that Udemy course. Go straight into it. That way you can have the course completed and if after four hours you don't want to stop, you can keep going and going and going in the course there. You can grab the coupon anytime on my website. I'll put up a jerrybanfield.com slash Udemy at the end of every lecture. So that way you know when you've just completed a lecture and then when it drops off, you'll see that you've started a new lecture. And anytime you can save at where you're at on the video and come back and watch this later. If you want to ask Ermin questions, you can count on an answer to every single question you ask in the course on Udemy. Thank you very much for watching this, and you won't see me again until the very end of the video. Welcome everybody to this tutorial. Today I am going to go ahead and show you how to actually install a virtualizer on your Windows 8.1 machine. The procedure is pretty much the same for any other Windows machine as well, so this applies universally on pretty much all Windows systems out there. Anyway, uh, this will be 
a bit weird because I am installing a virtualizer on a virtual machine because as you can see uh, I have let me just minimize this I have Windows virtual machine running within Linux and in behind I have my Red Hat website opened there we will download Red Hat in the follow-up tutorial but for the time being I just want to show you that this is a virtual machine and you can see it runs just fine you have uh, this gray menu bar in the top in the upper part of your screen but I mean that's easily fixable switch to full screen yep there we go switch there we go so it seems as though I really do have a Windows machine but in fact this is a virtual machine and for all intents and purposes this pretty much works so if I go down I have uh, these things here I have my menu back up but I don't need my menu for the time being I just want to show you how you can do pretty much the same thing for Red Hat as I have done for Windows 8.1 now there are other methods of virtualization uh, there are other approaches to do this I will show three if I'm not mistaken or a couple don't hold my word to it where you will be able to do different things for example you'll be able to virtualize your Red Hat machine within a Windows environment you will be able to perform a dual boot of your Windows and Red Hat as well or any other Linux distro and the third option uh, you will be able to have your main machine to be a Linux based operating system preferably Red Hat but it can be pretty much anything else and you will install a virtualizer on that particular machine from where you will have access to your Windows 8 Windows machine should you need it now there are different approaches to this last part you can have a simple virtualizer like VirtualBox and pretty much run but I think that's 50% at capacity if you install a Zen virtualizer you have 95% native performance which is fantastic which means that you really can play games and use Photoshop or do anything of a kind uh, perform such tasks so you, you can literally run a game a video game I don't know let's uh, let's say Call of Duty or something like that with good perform with 95% native performance on Xen virtual machine of Windows and it's gonna work just fine provided of course that you have configured everything properly on your main Linux machine anyway let's take this first approach and before I do let me just uh, mention it mention it briefly any one of these approaches that you take you will be able to follow through the tutorial so just take a look I will show three for different cases uh, any one you choose to set up any any of the three that you actually choose and set up it will be fine you'll be able to follow through the entire tutorial without any problems of whatsoever so there you won't be hindered uh, whichever one you choose I just set it for personal preferences uh, which are which are way people want it to be anyway let's just jump into Windows now I'm here I'm gonna open up a default web browser which is basically Explorer here it says I have written in VirtualBox 32-bit uh, be careful to actually download a proper one although you can't really make a mistake because if you search the web for VirtualBox 32-bit you're gonna be thrown onto a Oracle website it won't be VirtualBox official website but it will be like uh, Oracle its maintainer and creator and you can download it from there no problem so if you go to the Oracle website here let me just show you I'm gonna do a web search and pretty much the second one uh, that pops that will be a place where you can go and download it there we go so once again I found myself on that website as you can see you have virtual box for numerous operating systems down there most of them are Linux platforms uh, different Linux pl platforms require uh, different modifications in order for this virtualizer to be able to run so you got here it says platform Windows 32-bit 64-bit no problems I just just uh, click on this and it's gonna start to download as you can see at the bottom of my screen it says virtual box 4326 something uh, win.exe download complete 
notes. I'm not going to be downloading it during this tutorial, but you just click on this, uh, click on the selected part, and your download will begin no matter which browser you are using. It took me about maybe four or five minutes to download it. I figured I wouldn't do that during the tutorial itself. So let's just go ahead and minimize this, please. Yes. No. Uh, the Explorer. Explorer is always wonderful. It really should install Firefox or something like that, but it's a virtual machine, so I don't give it that much attention. Anyway, go ahead, uh, visit your downloads folder. It's, let's see, where is it? There we go. So VirtualBox 4.3, ah, there we go. No, which is the latest version of the lower one. Also, yeah. Make it your business to actually have always the latest versions of the software. They can that can save you so much trouble. I mean, I can't even begin to explain it. So it's an exit file. Just start up the wizard. No big deal. And okay, so the wizard has been started. It says Oracle VM Box 4326 setup welcome, etc. Just click next. That's no big deal there. So you have some sort of a custom, pretty much like any other installation, uh, if you want to play around with it, uh, feel free, but I'm not. I'm just going to use a default install here. So create, register, okay, no problems. Next. Install a virtual network config. Yep, okay, so if you're performing a download of some sort while you're are installing VirtualBox, make sh make sure that you can continue them or that you at least don't care for them, primarily because your network interfaces are going to be reset. So just type in yeah, click yes, install, and okay, you need a permission there, excellent. So the installation process is un in route. This is, is not gonna take that long of a time. And in that period of time, I'll see if I can actually minimize Windows Explorer. Can I? Yes, I can through a very inefficient method, but oh well. Anyway, the installation procedure is going on, and even though I'm running this on a virtual machine, you there is no difference. No, I don't want you to start it. There is no difference. You will be doing exactly the same steps on your physical Windows machine if you are a Windows user straight away. I will, of course, demonstrate how to perform this process on Linux as well, so don't worry about it. If you have already installed a Linux version or using a Linux machine, I will show you how to do it. So basically, just go ahead and click on Oracle VirtualBox. Should run anytime. And excellent. This is your uh, Oracle VirtualBox interface. There is, from this point on, there pretty much are no differences uh, between virtual machines, between Linux and Windows. Pretty much the procedures are the same. There isn't anything special that you're going to do here that you're not going to do there. Basically, just download an ISO file from the net uh, and then install it. I will perform the installation procedure in the next tutorial and explain a few features to which you should really pay attention here. Actually, I might uh, just mention a few of them. So let me just uh, go ahead and do this because I already have a few virtual machines installed here. So what I've noticed over the over the course of time is that people get confused with certain things. So look, I have Windows 8.1, it says running. I select it, I right click it, I say settings. And starting, yep, there we go. So there are a few things here which you should be aware. Uh, for example, on network, I have if you need to say that it's a bridged adapter. So remember, select bridged adapter, and then under the name, you select the name of the interface of the network interface that your physical machine is using. I cannot tell you which inter which interface that is because I don't know. Machines use different interfaces from one machine to the other but I can definitely show you where you can find out. I uh, just uh, go back to your, I just, I'm just gonna go back to my machine, uh, open up your, okay, I'm not gonna be able to show you here, but hold on, come on, please, no, 
Yes, thank you. Search. The control panel. Open it up. So network and internet. Adapters. I need adapters. Do, do, do. Network and network sharing center. Okay, there we go. So this is this here. Uh, this is the this. These are your adapters, and you just take a look at these adapters here. If you're using a Windows physical machine, uh, you take a look at these adapters here, and then you just uh, open up your network manager, and you see Network Three connected, Ethernet Network Three. So this is the this is the adapter that you are using, and this is what you will select in your virtual box when you perform an installation on your main machine. This is how you would perform the checkup procedure in Windows to see which network adapter you are using in order to select it in VirtualBox right here. So there we go. Yeah, I know it might seem a bit confusing because I'm jumping from one system to another now, but don't worry about it. I have simply performed this to show you where you can find a VirtualBox a virtualizer on Windows, uh, where you can download it for free and from that point on it gets really simple. You just uh, install the system there, install an operating system there, download it first and that is it. No difference. Uh, I will be showing some of the things in Linux how to do it. I'll be showing pretty much the same things in Windows but you will see that the differences are pretty much trivial. In any case I would like to bid you all farewell till next time. Next time we will download Red Hat and actual and perform an actual installation on a virtual box. So that will be one of the approaches that we're going to take to virtualize the environment of Red Hat. And then we'll after that I'll show you how to perform a dual boot between Windows 8.1 and Linux. Welcome all to this tutorial. Today I'm going to show you how to and where to download Red Hat and how can you install it on VirtualBox. Now even though uh, I know I've said that this is going to be done in Windows 8.1 and here I have indeed showed you how to actually install VirtualBox in Windows 8.1, now I mainly want to show you how to use VirtualBox and how to actually install an operating system here in your virtualized environment. It does not matter if you are using Mac, Linux, uh, BSD, Windows and pretty much whatever else is out there that is supported by VirtualBox or that supports VirtualBox, the interface is the same. There are minor trivial differences which basically do not matter at all. I can't imagine why they would. So I'm just going to use a VirtualBox on my physical machine which is Fedora but the interface is exactly the same. I could obviously do it here in a virtual machine, but to install a virtual machine within a virtual machine, yeah, I would need, uh, I basically could do it, but it would completely eat up my RAM. If you just uh, take a look at this, uh, where is it? Over here, this is the this is the current load of my system. So it's a, it's a bit ridiculous, right? So the four cores of the processor, look at the look at the load. I mean there it's like 39, 41, 48, 45, something like that. And look at the RAM usage. I have around eight gigs of RAM. Out of those eight gigs, I'm using six. So many things running on my computer at the moment. So I'm just gonna use a virtual box, which is here on my Linux system, the giant spinning around the screen now. But the procedure is exactly the same. I mean, just take a look at this one. This it says Oracle VM Virtual Box Manager, and now take a look at this one in Windows. They are exactly the same. Maybe there are some design differences at the corners, and a bit of difference in terms of colors. But that's about it. There's pretty much no difference in terms of functionality or what you do here. Anyway, what do I have? I have Red Hat here running. Okay, we're not, not going to need that power off the machine. And I'm gonna delete this one, delete all files, just so that I can repeat the installation procedure for you. I did go through it uh, once, I mean I have went through CentOS once and everything like that, I like to go through them before I actually begin the tutorial, just because sometimes you encounter problems, flaws, and if I do encounter them I like to report them during the tutorials and show people how to resolve them in advance just in case they encounter them. Anyway, 
I'll just move that out of the way. So you just open up your browser on whatever operating system you are using. And if you're using Windows, it doesn't matter. Just open up your browser as I have opened it now. Uh, go ahead and type in to your search engine, I don't know, like Red Hat. <laughs> Amazing. Red Hat. Okay, Red Hat, the world's open source leader. This is their website. And here you would log in. So you do, you do need to create an account in order to do this. Creating an account on Red Hat is absolutely free. And once you actually create an account there, uh, head over to this link. But you can navigate on the page without problems. But I'm just going to give you a link as the worst case scenario, I guess. Uh, let me just zoom it in. So it's here, basically, in the download section. It's not that hard to find. There are a lot of Linux distros out there. Uh, there are a lot of uh, different versions of Red Hat, depending for what purpose are you downloading. And Red Hat, it, even though it is open source, it is not free. Some, that something is open source does not necessarily have to mean that it's free of charge. Although Red Hat itself is an operating system, uh, they don't actually charge for that. Rather, instead, they charge for the support. So if you want to access the repositories for which you can download software and updates and so on and so forth, you will need to pay a yearly fee. Now the good news is that the yearly fee is like $50 for regular users for companies or something like that. It can go up to 3k or something of a kind. But hey, you are a regular user, so it's only 50 bucks. And if you don't want to pay for those even if you don't want to pay 50 bucks or something like that for a uh, for the support or something of a kind, it's fine. There is something called CentOS on my other page. Well, just uh, here. Just type into your search engine CentOS. I'm using Firefox here, but doesn't really matter. Whichever operating system, whichever browser. Uh, CentOS, go and visit their page. I'm just going to close this one because I have another one opened. And there you go. CentOS is pretty much a copy of Red Hat. Red Hat does not have a problem with that. Just a heads up, uh, heads up info or something of a kind. Red Hat does not have a problem with CentOS. In fact, they cooperate on a lot of things. Here's why. Uh, CentOS doesn't actually charge for anything. It's completely free. It's open source. You can download it for free without any sort of registration required. And it gives the users a chance to see what Red Hat can be really like. Furthermore, uh, you can... The one of the fundamental differences between CentOS and Red Hat is the support. Pretty much everything else is more or less the same. So you can download it and you should be able to follow through the tutorial without any bigger difficulties of whatsoever as things will be pretty much the same. If you do encounter in some, uh, into some problems, please do let me know. I will be more than happy uh, to jump in and help you out. Now, there are a few things that you should pay attention here when downloading CentOS. Make sure that you know whether your system is a 32-bit or a 64-bit operating system. If it's 64-bit, it won't matter. You will be able to run 32-bit images and 64-bit images without any problems. However, if it is a 32-bit system, then you will not be able to run 64-bit images. And I, ha I have made a bit of a spin here with words, but I think you get the meaning. Uh, make sure that you know whether it's 32-bit or 64-bit. Anyway. So you have a DVD ISO, everything ISO, minimal ISO, uh, you can certainly choose one of these three, but what I would recommend if you're going to download CentOS, uh, just to go, if this is not for you, alternative downloads might be. So just go ahead and click here. Uh, this will give you a choice. So you have CentOS uh, 7 and the version of the 7, and you have it only for 64-bit systems, if I'm not mistaken. And down below, you have CentOS 6. If you're using a 32-bit system, just go ahead and download this one where it says I386. Just in case you are using a 32-bit system, please keep in mind a lot of people make this mistake and then they can't install it in the virtual box. They get a lot of errors. They can't figure out what is wrong, but eventually they do. And it's not a major obstacle, I would say, but it certainly does cause a loss of time just a bit of attention and you can save yourselves a lot of trouble. Now I won't be showing the installation for CentOS but it's it's like exact, it's almost exactly the same if not exactly the same. Red Hat, CentOS and Fedora they're pretty much the same so no problems there. Uh, Fedora is just a open source free distro maintained by Red Hat 
that is for desktop users it's very nice that is the one that I like to use as my uh, desktop machine well not my desktop machine I run it on my laptop and it has served me extremely well anyway uh, we are now on Red Hat's website I have logged into my account I have logged into my account sorry for that and I am here at the downloads page download a product so it says Red Hat Enterprise Linux desktop that is the one that you will need and it says 7.1 latest excellent 64-bit uh, architecture prior to this uh, you are gonna have a downloads page and stuff of a kind browse the site see what's see what suits you but this is the one that I have chosen to download if you want another version of it uh, just go to the download section on the site as soon as you log in you will be as, as soon as you create the actual account uh, which is fairly simple to do you will be given an option to actually go to the download section and there you can pretty much choose whatever you want I have chosen to download Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, for desktops I know it says that it's not a uh, that it's perhaps not the best for servers or something like that but believe me but you can install packages you can configure it and it can run as a fantastic server and besides it has pretty much all the functionalities however as the other ones do however uh, you do need to bother with the installation of extra packages configuration and addition of stuff as opposed to some other uh, variations which where you don't need to do this and for example Red Hat, Lin Red Hat server or something of a kind, it would support file sizes up to a petabyte or something of a kind, which is humongous. Uh, you're definitely not going to need that realistically ev ever. I mean, uh, unless you work in a large company or something of a kind and then they have these products, but the management, the commands, the setup, everything is pretty much the same. There's very little difference. So. Uh, go ahead and select uh, Red Hat 7.1 binary DVD download. You don't need the supplementary DVD. Uh, just go ahead and download the binary DVD, the middle one. Click on the download ad. It's going to download for you. It's 3.57 gigabytes. So it might take a while for you to download. I'm not going to download it now, but I have downloaded it previously. You can see it here. I have actually downloaded it twice because the first uh, the first download was incorrect. Didn't really work out, so I just downloaded it again, which was really a painful experience, uh, as it is a rather large file, and I don't have a really fast internet connect that fast of an internet connection here. It's like five megabits, so that's uh, that that was kind of painful, but okay. Anyway, uh, feel free to pause the tutorial here and then continue on when the download is done because you're going to need this file in order to proceed. Anyway, just go ahead, let's just go ahead and start up our virtual box so that we may actually begin the installation process. Anyway, as I have said, t -t -t uh, okay, so where is it, where is it? As I have said, I'm only show you, showing you the application here, and the usage of this application is exactly the same across all supported platforms, pretty much. So on Windows, Linux, Mac, whatever, the setup is pretty much the same. There is nothing fundamentally different that you need to do in order to perform the setup there. The installation process is, uh, is, is different on different platforms. But the application itself, the, the software, it's not. It's pretty much the same. It displays the same sort of information. The process is exactly the same, so no worries there. Okay, so let's go and actually create our Red Hat machine. I'm going to go ahead and uh, let's just minimize this, shall we? And I don't really need this. Let's just... I like to keep this uh, this part open so I know what is going on in the background. Well, maybe not in the background, but I know the load in my system. I know that there are utilities that you can put on the side that can be really useful. But for the time being, I'm just going to leave it as it is so I can monitor the usage. You can see this is ridiculous. It gets up to 90% in all four cores. 
Ah, uh, that's that's a uh, that's a joy. Anyway, even though it's an i7 processor, uh, yeah. Anyway, let's just go ahead and click on new. Select the name of our virtual machine. Uh, what shall it be? Let's call it Red Hat. You see it says type Linux. Okay, so it recognized that by default. And it also said that the version Red Hat 64-bit. Make sure that you select the proper uh, proper version for yourself, either 32-bit or 64-bit, depending on what you have downloaded and depending on what your system supports. So please be aware of that. Uh, don't make that mistake. Anyway, it's 64-bit for me, so go ahead and click on Next. I would recommend giving it around, I'm going to give it around 1.2 gigs of RAM. Okay, so I know that on the net, uh, the information exists, and this is really true, that Linux systems can run on 56 megabytes of RAM. So 56 megabytes of RAM is actually doable on a Linux system. You can actually run it, which is hilarious. I know, right? 56 megabytes, but that's not really a recommended thing. Depending on what you're going to do, that is the amount of RAM that you're going to require. But if you if you have RAM to spare, I would recommend uh, giving it 1.2 for smooth operations. However, you can also give it 750 megabytes, and you can even go down to, I think, uh, 250 megabytes. But you shouldn't really go lower than 750 if you don't absolutely need to, primarily because you might experience some lag. Let's put it so. It's going to work. It's going to work, that's for sure. It's going to function, but you might experience some lag during your operations. But anyway, assign, uh, assign either 1.2 gigs or whatever else you can spare that is below 1.2 gigs for this purpose. However, as I said, I will show three separate methods of how you can do this, how you can actually run Red Hat parallel to your Windows machine. You can choose either three of them, see what works out for you. Uh, if you see one and if you perform that setup and if you like it, you can just uh, take a look at the other two uh, so you can see what else is possible, but you don't necessarily need to do all three of them. Anyway, uh, so it's 1.2. Let's see if we can aim it a little bit better. 1.23. Okay, so let's go next. Create a virtual hard drive now. Create uh, VDI hard drive file type. Okay, next dynamically allocated. Next, and now we need to provide storage. Okay, this is uh, getting a little bit annoying, so I'm gonna move it out of the way. But okay, so there we go. Here I have my temperature gadget. I like to keep an eye on that as well. Primarily because you, you've seen the load on my CPU and all of that. Uh, it's it's a good idea to keep an eye on these things. Anyway, let's just assign it around. Uh, I'm going to give it 32 gigabytes of space on my hard drive. And that's going to be, well, acceptable. But you can assign it whatever you can spare. I mean, okay, so maybe I can give it 128 gigabytes. But that's not really going to make a difference. I'm just doing it to show you basically what you can do. I have a lot of space here. So I can use it. You, I can use a lot. Anyway, go ahead and click on create. But if you don't have assign whatever you can spare, uh, 32 gigs would be very nice. Anyway, now you need to go ahead and click right click settings. System. Oh, sorry, not system. Uh, storage. You have controller IDE, and down below it says empty. Go ahead and click on empty. In the upper right corner, you have choose virtual CD DVD disk or a physical drive. So you can actually insert a CD, a pre burned CD, into your machine and then use that one. But why bother when you have a, an ISO image ready standing by? So just click on choose a virtual CD drive. And it doesn't matter on what system you are, again, you will be prompted with a file manager here, file browser, and then you will be able to navigate to the folder where you have downloaded your uh, Red Hat from your Red, Red Hat Linux dis distribution from the website. So here I have downloaded mine here, it's DVD1. OK, 
Okay, so open. It's selected there. I click OK. And then from here, I'm going to actually perform the installation. But I'm running a little bit short on time. So I'm going to call the tutorial here and show you the install and continue showing you the installation process in part two. Welcome back everybody. Let's just go ahead and start the installation procedure itself. So just go ahead and double click on your Red Hat icon or your Red Hat machine that you have created. There we go. We get prompted immediately. Uh, just go ahead and select install Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Press enter and there we go. The installation should start shortly. Don't worry about this failure. Uh, it should begin loading soon, hopefully. I'm not going to be forced to eat my own words. Please, <laughs> I'm begging you. There we go. Uh, it's working out, so it's relatively slow, but oh well. There's a lot to load. Anyway, keynote here. The screen will be small until we actually finish the installation itself. It will get a bit bigger during the installation process itself. But there we go. But until we actually install VirtualBox guest editions, we're not going to have the functionality of a full screen mode. I will show you how to do this, of course. And the process is not different whether you are doing this on Windows, Linux, or Mac. It's you are doing exactly the same things. Also, if you are installing CentOS, again, little or no difference. Some trivial, insignificant things that you probably won't even notice are there. You're not going to have, for example, this red Red Hat icon in the upper left corner. Okay, so go ahead and select the language of your preference. Oh, by the way, since the guest editions are not yet installed, you're going to have to capture your device. Uh, devices, by that I mean your mouse and your keyboard, and you see you won't be able to escape the virtual machine box. And if you press right control, uh, you will be able to escape it. When you press right control again, it will capture and you will be confined to the size of the screen. Anyway, go ahead and select your language preferences. Uh, click on continue. I think that your keyboard should be set by default when you select the language preferences. And there we go. That is done. Go ahead and select the time zone that you wish. Just go ahead and click it to any place where you are at the moment, what you have selected. I'm just going to leave it as it is. That does not matter for me at the time, but for you it might. So make sure to correct it to the correct time zone if you wish to get accurate time. It says language is set, software selection. Okay, so let's go into software selection. Oops, sorry. And let's see what we are going to install. Now, what I have on my physical machine here is a KDE Plasma workspace, but I'm going to go ahead and install GNOME desktop here. Why, if you ask? Why do you ask? Well, I want to show you that there are different sorts of desktop here, and I can show you one type of desktop on my physical machine, and I can show you a different type of desktop on the Red Hat machine just so that you know that there are differences and you will see that the differences are significant. Okay, so what do we want? We want internet applications, conferencing such. Uh, sure, why not? A set of commonly used, sure, why not? Client for doing backup, uh, clients for connecting to a backup server and doing backups. No, we do not need that at the moment. If we do, we can install it easily. Legacy X Windows System Compatibility. Uh, okay, I'm going to go ahead and select this as well, primarily because I might need it later on. And I don't want to bother with dependencies, but generally you won't need it. Okay, so this is definitely a choice that you should take Office Suite and Productivity. Smart Card Support. Well, I don't know if you need it, use it. If not, oh well. You can uh, keep in mind that all of these things, including the desktops themselves, you can install and delete later on uh, as you choose to, after the installation. This is not a Windows operating system. You can actually delete the current desktop, uh, delete the current graphical user interface, and install a new one that is uh, more to your liking. Okay, so smart card, compatibility libraries. OK, this is uh, not a bad idea integrating trust okay yeah there we go let's just go ahead and click on plasma workspace to see what is offered here uh, so you see you have perhaps 
Uh, actually, no. It's pretty much the same things. Sometimes on KDE you have a bit more things uh, that they offer, but this is not the case here. Anyway, there are other desktop environments other than GNOME and KDE. Again, you can delete both either one of these upon installation and then install whatever you want, like LXD or uh, KDE, uh, not KDE, sorry, XFC or something of a kind, whatever suits your needs. Well, let's just say software selection is done. Checking for software dependencies, this might take a while. Uh, and now we have installation source, it's checking for software dependencies. Excellent, it has found both. We don't need the additional CD if you selected some, perhaps some other options, perhaps you would need it, but not in this particular case. It says installation destination, automatic partitioning selected. Okay, let's go, uh, let's go into installation destination and the partitioning schemes. Keep in mind that you can create multiple disks in VirtualBox, as many as you like, or as many as your hardware can support. So we're going to be playing around with that later on, and we're going to be creating new partitions on new drives. Uh, but for the time being, I'm just going to go ahead and select the default installation, primarily because there isn't really a need to play around here any further. I will teach you how to partition disks, how to format them, and how to configure them to pretty much any setup you want. For the time being, uh, you can just select the automatic configuration and that will do the trick. Uh, you can also, what I generally recommend is set the encryption immediately here so you don't have to bother with it later on. So I'm just going to go ahead and say encrypt my data. You can, if you, you can put some simple, you can put the simplest of passwords there if you don't care about it, but have it there. It's not a bad layer of security to have. It's actually pretty good, uh, especially when you lose something or when you, especially on laptops. <laughs> if you lose a laptop, if the data is encrypted on it, nobody's going to be able to access it. Don't worry about it. Uh, this is just to save you a bit of time later on, but primarily what people tend to do is encrypt individual files where they have certain things that are stored. Okay, let's go let's go ahead and click on full disk summary and bootloader so you can see that everything here is on a single disk it's SDA and okay so yeah this is probably not the best thing to do but as I said later on when the installation is done I will show you in detail how you can partition how you can create new partitions uh, delete old ones or uh, change the existing ones Anyway, for the time being, just go ahead and click done. Uh, this encryption passphrase, I will type in test, but you can type in whatever you want. Uh, make sure, and I can't emphasize this enough, make sure that you do not forget your encryption passphrase. If you do forget it, you can say goodbye to your data, quite literally. I'm not kidding. Uh, if you lose your encryption, if keys, it's gone. You won't be able to recover it. There are some brute forcing methods out there and something of a kind, but if you have a complex encryption key that you have forgotten, chances are that you will not be able to recover the information that you have there at all. You will, of course, be able to reformat the drive and create and free up the space, but you will not be able to retrieve the information. So keep in mind, it is very important that you remember this save passphrase installation destination saving configuration it says network and host name so let's just go ahead and see what we can do about that uh, we need to say that this is on okay so IP address submit mask default route DNS excellent so this is done as well oh by the way you can see that I have configured my router to the open DNS servers we can talk about DNS a bit later on. For the time being, I just wanted to mention it. So KDump is a kernel crashing dumping mechanism in the event of a system crash. That is all you need to know about that for the time being. Uh, just leave it on default, leave it on uh, automatic, and it will, if, if a crash happens or something of a kind, it will be recorded so you will need you will be able to extract some valuable information from it it does take up a bit of resources but it's fine it's not a lot 
Anyway, begin installation. As the installation is going through, there are a few things. Uh, the system needs a random data. You can prove this by typing in randomly on the keyboard or moving the bell. <laughs> Random data quality, amazing. Anyway, uh, user settings. Configure your root password and look, for my user passwords for this particular machine that I am most likely going to delete after I have finished this tutorial, you will, I mean, configure something that you, because you will use the root password on daily basis and on hourly basis if you're working, I mean, you're going to type it in a lot of times during your working sessions. So choose something that is complex and that you can remember. I would suggest definitely more than eight characters long, uh, something that does not contain words from the English dictionary or words from any dictionary for that matter at all. Make sure that it has numbers, letters, lowercase, uh, uppercase, and that it has some symbols included, definitely. And it needs to, it should be greater than eight. For the purposes of this tutorial, because uh, the security on this machine, in particular in terms of password strengths, is not that relevant primarily to me because this is a virtual machine, I can type in whatever I want. But I'm going to go ahead and type in my password. I'm going to make sure that it's a lengthy one. So let's see. Okay, so this is going to be probably an overkill for a virtual machine, but oh well. Passwords you have provided this week fails the dictionary check. <laughs> ah, okay, so let's just uh, see what we can uh, what we can do here. Uh, I don't know. Let's see if this is going to work. Ah, oh, come on. You have to press done twice to confirm it. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to use whatever. We can change it later on if we want. I will show you how to change the root password, then later on we will actually configure a much better password for this, uh, but I don't want to lose time now during the installation procedure. Now you can type in a full name here if you wish, and it will be displayed for you when you log in. I'm not going to type it in, but it doesn't really matter. I'm just going to type in the username uh, creator or uh, random guy okay <laughs> a random guy that's gonna be my username but you can also type in your full name here and what you can type in whatever you want for the username I generally like to conf I like to do a lot of partitioning in the post installation period and the configuration of the root password as well and I can also change the encryption keys uh, during the installation I generally pick the simplest possible things and then later on we actually improve upon the security in the post installation process. Besides, I really want I really wanted to save these things for an opportunity to later on show you uh, when we actually start using the terminal how you can actually change all these things because it is far more important for you, trust me, to be able to change them in the Linux terminal than anything else. Okay, so let's uh, user random guy will be created. Excellent. So the installation is now running. I'm going to leave it to run. I'm not, I don't think I shall wait for the end of it uh, during this tutorial. But if there are any changes or anything of a kind, rest assured, I will take some screenshots and I will explain it in, uh, I will explain it in greater detail in the follow-up tutorial. However, for the time being, I'm just going to let the installation run. And once it is finished, I'm going to continue on from there and we will see what we can actually do once the system once the operating system is actually installed uh, to install VirtualBox guest editions to get introduced to the GUI of the GUI uh, graphical user interface of Red Hat and then we're going to jump into the terminal as well to see how things actually work there. Until then I bid you all farewell and I wish you a lot of luck. 
Welcome back everybody. Let's just continue on. So I have my virtual machine here. It's running. The installation process is complete. There, I didn't take any screenshots. Nothing special there. Just let it finish till the end. That is all. Nothing else. So uh, go ahead and click on reboot. Uh, capture. Okay. So until we install guest editions. So it's rebooting now. Just wait for it. Shouldn't take that long. And after it reboots, we're going to be doing several things which you will need to do afterwards. The post installation procedure. Uh, let's just. Uh, you can you can let that run. You don't need to actually change it there to boot or anything like that. So please enter passphrase for disk. Uh, if you remember, we have encrypted them. And I have entered the decryption password. It is very important that you remember your encryption keys, as I've stated previously. Uh, if you are the sort of person that forgets them, write them down. If you don't feel like putting it, if you feel like that you're going to forget it or something like that, better than not to put it because you're going to lock yourself out of your own disk and that's going to be pretty bad. Anyway, what I wanted to say is that if you decided to actually get the Red Hat subscription for $50, uh, you will be able to enable certain repositories from which you will be able to pull the information from. Okay, so license is not accepted. We will fix that shortly. Let's just click on I accept license agreement. Done. Finish configuration and boot into your Red Hat machine for the first time. As I said, we're going to have access to certain repositories, but no big deal there. You should really know. Uh, you should really like know how to do this. Primarily because tomorrow, when you're managing Red Hat systems, uh, you will need to enable individual subscriptions for machines and what machine has access to what sort of packages from the Red Hat network. Anyway, here it says uh, subscription registration. This assistant will guide you through the process of registering your system. With Red Hat to receive software updates and other benefits. Okay, so you don't need to register now. It is not necessary. But let's just go ahead and say that we do want to register here. And then afterwards, I will show you how can you register in the post-installation period as well through the command via the command line. So let's just select, yes, I'd like to register now. Forward. I will register a subscription. Okay, so default, I will use a few. No, we do not need proxies. Done. Let's see what happens now. Uh, come on, come on. Yep, there we go. So is it going to show my password? No, it will not. So login name, I believe it was creator69. So original, right? And I even misspelled it. There we go. There we go with that as well. So just type in uh, the username that you have created on the Red Hat website through the process of registration and then use the same password, no problems. If you forgot it, of course, you can go to Red Hat and say forgot password or something of a kind and it will reset it to your email or something. So please enter the following for the system system name. Okay, we don't uh, we don't actually need to do that at the moment. We can just leave it at default. Done. So subscription management registration registering. You will only be able to do this if you actually bought the license itself for one year, where Red Hat provides updates, maintenance, and support. Well, not maintenance. Sorry, uh, provides updates and support, which is very nice. As I said, you can you can at all times just go over to the website and basically start a chat, and they will help you out with pretty much everything that you need. Okay, so Red Hat Enterprise Linux Desktop, so support uh, type virtual quantity one done. Go for it. Attaching subscriptions. This should finish up shortly. Oh, by the way. Uh, okay, so it's finished actually before I had the chance to show you, but it doesn't really matter. I have uh, I have the command standing by. Here's what I want to show you basically. 
Uh, there are these two commands which you can use in order to register yourself from the command line on a system which has already been installed. So random guy shall now log in for the first time. No, don't do this to me. Yes, there we go. Uh, I almost thought I forgot my password, which would be uh, quite embarrassing, but oh well, what can you really do about it? These things happen. I will later on probably show you how to actually recover your password from a loss as well, so that shouldn't be a problem. Excellent, so we have booted into Red Hat, and you can see it's a relatively simple desktop without that much configuration. So, uh, capture. Yep. So I'm just going to leave it here uh, with English United Kingdom. You can change it to whatever you wish, of course. Uh, you can add additional keyboards here if you would like, but no, I don't need any additional keyboards. Okay, so you can also add some accounts here on the cloud, but generally not a bright idea if you're going to uh, link your Facebook account or something like that. Uh, just like here if I say add account, let me just show you, you can say Google, oh, uh, no, don't do this to me, add account, okay, so I got Google, own cloud, uh, Facebook, some other things, all in all, if you have business accounts that are directly related to this machine, or here, physically, well, not physically, but uh, the accounts that you own, that you use for business and for transactions and stuff of a kind, I would then definitely suggest uh, to actually link them with strong passwords. But I definitely would not suggest you linking, I don't know, a Facebook account for f uh, which you use basically for socializing or something of a kind, uh, or anything that falls into that category of non-professional things. So don't, don't do that if you're gonna have a professional account sure but something for fun no point just open up your browser and log in I'll just go ahead and cancel that and press on next start using Red Hat Enterprise Linux client excellent so now we're in Red Hat and okay it's gonna give us some getting started in the browser but we don't actually need that at present because I know where things are uh, feel free to read through that if you wish. The desktop is fairly simplistic. Uh, this is GNOME, if I'm not mistaken, and you don't have. You can install different desktops here with more uh, advanced graphical features, but we'll see what we can do later on to actually uh, change the out to change how this thing looks like. But before we do anything. I want to have a full screen mode. I don't want to be messing around with this uh, small image and I'm sure you don't want to be looking at it either. So go into devices, insert guest editions CD image. Could not find VirtualBox guest edition disk image file. Do you wish to download this disk image file from the internet? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Sure you want to download VirtualBox from Okay, so which site is it? DLC, cdnsun.com, VirtualBox. Okay, so yeah, go ahead and download it. Make sure to check these things. If uh, they look fishy or something of a kind, then don't. Uh, rather, instead, copy the address and check it out on the net. See if it's legit or something of a kind. If it's not, then absolutely do not. Uh, while this is going on, while the network operations manager is going on, let's just go into devices, uh, network, network settings. Make sure to change this from NAT to bridge adapter. But I'm just going to leave it running for now while the download is going on because I don't want to actually interfere with it in any way. But change it from NAT to bridged and then under name select an adapter as I have showed you in the previous tutorials make sure that you do that uh, don't forget to do it primarily because well it's better to have a machine with an individual LAN IP address that is 
separate and detached from the others but that can yet communicate without any problems of whatsoever as opposed uh, to it going through NAT which is uh, not really good not something that I favor anyway not that it's not that good it's good for protection and firewalls just to give you an example of what NAT is it's network address translation so let's say you have a router your own home router that you use in your house that has been given to you by your ISP provider for which you paid money and then you have a machine behind it like a laptop desktop or a phone or whatever it doesn't really it, it's completely relevant then all the communication is done through that router and that router is the device which actually has a public IP address from there all the requests are forwarded to the machines that actually made those requests so if you're opening up a web browser uh, not a web browser sorry if you're opening up a website it's gonna go through the router and then the router is gonna receive the information and forward them to the correct device within LAN that is why we use network address translation protocol but with the coming of the IPv6 addresses that's gonna become quite redundant anyway let's just go ahead and see oh this is still downloading okay so it's 50 percent now it is taking quite a while but no worries there uh, I assure you it's gonna finish while it while it is going on let's just have a look at some of the other features that we have here so oh, capture yep so this is where your name is displayed and you can play around with notifications uh, and this is also where you click when you want to turn your machine off in terms of GUI into settings and other things we will uh, get into later but for the time being let's just go over some of the basic options that you have here so we got settings we got logout we got lock we got power off by the way for lock you can use in most of the cases you can use control alt L and it's a really good habit for laptops especially if you leave them unattended not a good idea here you can just check out the date you have the calendar it's fairly simple uh, to take a look at it, the calendar like any other calendar, nothing much to say there. Over here, you go to the battery if you're in a laptop, and under oh, come on, under power settings. Aside from choosing your plan, uh, whether it's extensive use and high performance, or whether it's power saving mode, or something of a kind. Look, you have here blank screen so it will blank the screen after five minutes don't do that well this these are my preferences you can choose them to whatever you want them to be uh, automatic suspend off but when battery power is critical hibernate you can choose a uh, power off or hibernate surprisingly enough it doesn't have that many options like I do on Fedora but maybe Okay, no, apparently that's it. Not much there, but you know, when you're using Linux machines, the batteries tend to last forever. They're very uh, energy efficient, so to say. I don't want to get into all of these things at the moment. We will get uh, in the follow up tutorial, I will actually explain about the GUI and, well, not the follow up tutorial, but once we're through this mini chapter within a course uh, through these three ways in which you can actually set up your entire environment excellent so the virtual box guest edition disk image has been file has been successfully downloaded uh, do you wish to register this file image insert it into the virtual CD insert thank you very much important software updates uh, install them uh, come on capture Okay, so VirtualBox editions contain software intended to be automatically started. Would you like to run it? Uh, this is an equivalent of you putting a CD into your machine and running it. So just go ahead and run. It does require a password, so go ahead and type in your root password. Authenticate. Authenticating. Oh, come on. Excellent, so it's running this uh, in the terminal and it should finish up shortly, after which time I do believe that we're going to need to perform a reboot, but I'm kind of hoping that we won't, that it will catch it automatically. This, m this process, it might take a while, but 
building the main guest module failed. Okay, let's see if this is gonna present some major issues. I don't know, it can have some failures, it's still gonna work the way I've experienced it anyway on my other virtual machines. Press return to close this window. Excellent. So, are you gonna load it up now or do we need to restart? Oh, we definitely need a restart. So, install updates and restart. Sure, why not? Here we go. Okay, I don't want to capture. Excellent. So, let's just wait up until it boots and see what happens. Remember, we are looking for a full screen because I really don't feel like doing this on a small screen and believe me, neither will you. So once again, we are prompted for a decryption password. And there you go, it's booting up again. The boot process is not that slow, it's relatively fast. There are some updates that have been applied as well, but we will need to perform additional checkups on this and these systems need to be updated quite frequently too. Although, Unlike Windows, uh, it's not going to force a restart on you. It's not going to restart in the middle of things while you're doing something important. That will never happen with Linux, quite literally. And pretty much you do these sort of updates manually with the packet managers on regular basis, pretty much on daily basis. There are small updates. Although the updates for Linux are generally never big as updates for Windows, so it's going to take you a very short amount of time to fill them up. And it doesn't take like a process of ages. When you reset the machine, you get that spinning circle. It says, please do not turn your, your computer off until the updates apply. Oh, that's a killer. It can be a bit annoying, but oh well, what can you really do about it? not much if you want to if you want to apply updates in Windows that is what you have to do but in Linux not so much let's see how far this is uh, come on please okay so it has popped a little bit but still gonna take a while so I'm just gonna pause the tutorial here and we will continue on in the next one so you don't have to wait for this to be over Anyway, I bid you farewell until then. Welcome back everybody. Today I am just going to show you that the VirtualBox guest editions have indeed installed and the machine has indeed booted. So here it is, Red Hat Virtual Machine. I have switched it to full screen mode if I just uh, go ahead and tick this. There we go. So it says view here, I can switch it to full screen if I wish to do so, so you don't see any of the differences, so you don't see the VirtualBox uh, lines and toolbar. Anyway, so let me just go ahead and minimize it a little bit. The first time when you boot it up like this, when you log in, what I've noticed and what I've noticed with my previous virtual machines is that the VirtualBox guest editions don't load up immediately. So log in, uh, wait maybe uh, maybe 15 seconds, a bit more, maybe 20, something like that uh, for them to load. Try resizing your screen like this pretty sure that that doesn't have that much effect but something seems to be reloading in the background and it does help out the way I've noticed it apparently here it has broke I have broken something have I indeed broken something uh, no I haven't it does work perhaps the screen just uh, blanked out or something like that could not switch the monitor configuration okay so this is not a big deal here Anyway, as I said, just uh, try resizing the screen, wait for about 20 seconds or so, and the VirtualBox guest editions will inevitably load or should load anyway. Now, in this uh, tutorial, what I wanted to do with you is show you how you can actually perform a dual boot of Windows 8.1 and Red Hat. Now, this is only valid for Windows 8.1 and Windows 8, 
you're not going to have such difficulties uh, with Windows 7 or Vista or XP or anything of a kind. If you by any chance happen to have any of those operating systems and if you wish to perform a dual boot, uh, please do post it in the discussions. I will be more than happy to help you out and to give you detailed instructions on how to do that as that is a lot simpler. But the procedure is pretty much the same. Anyway, so as I said, I will show you three ways how you can set up your environment. One I have already shown to you, how to use VirtualBox and how to install it. The second one will be how to dual boot, how to perform a dual boot between Windows 8.1 and Red Hat. And the third one we will do way later on when I show you the virtualization process, uh, the one that I talked about where you get 95% native performance with Xen. I, didn't, I do not want to get into that with you now, primarily because I wish to go over the graphical user interface of Linux, Red Hat, and I wish to introduce you to the Linux command line and a few other things before we actually get into that, because that is a bit complicated and there are a lot of new stuff there, so I'm just afraid that a lot of people won't be able to follow it through. So for the time being, let's stick to the basics and we will later on move on to the more advanced stuff. Anyway, I'm just going to go ahead and minimize this machine. So this is my Windows 8.1 machine. Let me just go ahead and boot it up. And yep, there we go. So it is booting, no problems, hopefully. Yep, there we go. I thought I forgot a, uh, forgot a CD inside or something of a kind, but no, indeed, uh, Windows 8.1 should boot up. I don't know, the boot process for Windows is our fairly slow from what I've seen but doesn't really matter. I'm gonna try assigning more resources to this machine because I'm gonna let's see oh I didn't actually do this the proper way. See advanced uh, continue. You shouldn't actually see this but anyway I seem to have been messing around with the machine a, a little bit so to say and it's offering me to actually perform a repair, but I don't really need a repair. It's going to boot up no problems now. Anyway, I am doing the demonstration in VirtualBox, of course, in a virtualized environment, but the procedure is exactly the same with the real machines. Although there is a, there is a downside to this. For this particular method, you will require two hard drives. And this is basically a foolproof method that will work on pretty much any device out there as opposed to some other methods where you do it in a single drive and then encounter a ton load of problems because I've seen so many people complain on so many forums out there how Windows 8.1 doesn't play well with other operating systems at all. So I've decided against showing you other methods primarily because uh, a lot of problems were experienced by a lot of people using those methods. So I just figured I would show you the foolproof one, the one that is safe, the one that leaves you with the lowest chance of messing anything up. Anyway, so this is my Windows 8.1 machine. It is up and running. So this would be an equivalent of your physical machine. And I'm just gonna go ahead and power it off for the time being because I don't really need it or want it at the, at the time. I wish to install another one. As before, so just shut it down and as before you will of course need an ISO file of the operating system which you will burn to a CD. Once you have burned it to a CD just insert the CD into your machine and boot from it. Here's how you do it. So on a virtual box I'll of course use virtual things in a virtualized environment. But basically you see this where the one that I've selected now it says uh, controller IDE it says here empty now if I just select, a, where is it, uh, there we go, if I just select it, it's an equivalent of you inserting a CD, when I selected this ISO file, it's like, it's an equivalent of you inserting a CD, an installation CD into your machine and running the installation from there. Anyway, I'm just going to click here, OK, and your systems should be configured by default to boot from a CD, so you don't have to worry about that. If they are not, uh, it's going to be written in the bottom right corner. Anyway, it's going to it's going to be written there anyway. Like press F12 or Dell or F2 or something of a kind to get the boot configuration or boot setup running. And once you actually press one of those buttons, it 
gives you an option like would you like to boot from a CD would you like to boot from a hard drive from a USB or from network just uh, move, use up and down arrow keys to select the one that you want and press enter that is literally all you need to do I in the virtualized environment actually needed to do what I just did now there is another thing that I will do here that you do not need to do in the real world you see I have actually created a virtual hard drive another one so you do need two hard drives see one I have named Windows 8.1 vd dot vd and another one is Red Hat dot vdi anyway uh, if you are doing this in by any chance if you want if you're curious or if you want to do this in the virtual box you just play you just press uh, add the, oh, sorry not that add a CD or DVD device add a hard drive there we go and then you can say create a new disk or choose an existing disk if you say create a new disk it takes you through this process you just basically click next a uh, lot the size change the name and click create that is literally all and it will create it just and will create one just like this one if you named it so as well anyway not that important at all for you because you'll be running this on a physical machine this is a process for a physical machine so dual booting Windows 8.1 and Red Hat on two hard drives. Anyway, just go ahead and power on the machine now that you have the, the CD has been pre previously inserted before the restart. And there we go. We're immediately prompted for an option to actually install Red Hat Enterprise. We can just go ahead and select it. That's the first option, not the default one though, because it first offers a testing of a media. You can run the test if you want as well, but I don't think that there is that much of a need. The burning software today is relatively good and performs a lot of checkups itself. And the installation process is in route. I'm not gonna go through it in great detail as I have shown it to you already before, but there is one segment which I do wish to show you and which I do wish to explain further so to say that would be the partitioning play that would be the partitioning there it is okay to select an automatic partitioning scheme if you are using a single operating system or if you're just installing it onto an empty drive in a virtualized environment something of a kind it can be a quick workaround but what you really want to do is be able to partition it yourself during the installation procedure as well that can be very very nice primarily because you can do whatever you want with it you can uh, create a scheme that will, will suit your needs that will benefit you that you have deemed appropriate to yourself now we have one uh, one disk here it says ATA VBox hard disk this is my win this is where the Windows is located physically you can see it says only 3000 kilobytes of free space right next to it I have a hard disk it says uh, almost a hundred what oh okay this is uh, I've already ran an installation on this but you can see it says here SDA and SDB and then you have the amount of space that is free on it anyway they're both 100 gigs I'm sure that on your machine they won't be exactly 100 gigs each one of them uh, make sure to first figure out which disk you want to use so if your Windows is installed on one disk don't install it there install it on another disk uh, I'm not talking about partitions here I'm talking about two separate hard drives that are within your machine so just go ahead and select the one that is that you have chosen it's not empty there's something on it I don't know uh, some things that I have previously installed but doesn't really matter I'm just gonna go ahead and select it please be very careful also when doing this because if you I mean if you erase if you format the drive you're gonna lose information that you're gonna lose data you're not gonna be able to recover it f to the fullest of extents some of it you will be able to retrieve but this is not Windows partitioning or something like that once you delete things with Linux it's it's rather difficult to restore them even when I delete something in my terminal with an RM command it's gone I uh, you just you just learn to live with it anyway so as I said once again I can't emphasize this enough please select the proper hard disk if you have problems selecting the proper hard drive 
uh, feel free to post it in the discussions. I will be more than happy to help you out with it, but please do not just randomly click on stuff and delete, lose your data. Anyway, to select the drive, all you need to do is click on it and this, uh, this mark appears. You see this one, it appears now, and then when I click on it, it disappears. Excellent, so I have selected the second drive and I want to select, I will configure partitioning, that option. Excellent, so now we click on done and we're gonna be thrown here where we're given an opportunity to actually set it up ourselves. So I already have this and, oh, I have already installed Red Hat here previously, so let's just go ahead and delete it all. Since I'm not interested in that now, I wish to do it from scratch so that you can actually see how it is done. So we can have standard partitions, we can have Linux Volume Manager and some other things as well, but I'm just going to go ahead and select standard partitioning for this. I can actually, I could actually even select an LVM. And the first partition that we need to configure is root. Your system files will be located there. So I need to desired capacity, let's say 20 gigs. So 20 GB add mount point. Excellent, it is created now. I can encrypt it if I wish. Uh, yeah, you can create volume groups as well because Linux generally, uh, if you have a bunch of disks running under Linux, it just sees them, it can actually see them as a single hard drive. So it treats, I don't know, two, three, four disks as a single hard drive, no problems. You get that with the default installations of Linux, which is very nice. And if you go back to the root directory in Linux, you will always go back to root while going back to the root directory on Windows usually means going uh, selecting a disk where it is installed like C or something like that and then going there. If this is unclear to you now, I don't want you to worry about it at all. As we move in, as we move in deeper and deeper, when I give you clear examples of this, uh, you will understand it far better. Anyway, we have created the root partition and now we need to create a, well, we need to create a boot partition for our Red Hat. So add mount, oh, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. Okay, so it gave it the automatic size of 81 gig, uh, <laughs> gigabytes because I haven't assigned any size to it, which is a bit funny. So let's just go ahead and delete that and let's create another, let's create it again, so boot, Let's say, I don't know, you can probably get away with 500, with 100 megs, but I'm just going to say 500 megs to be certain because, I don't know, I guess I'm a cautious guy and I have a lot of space here. Literally, I can have like more space than I will probably ever need on this laptop. Anyway, so boot, root, and now we need home. So home is not, I mean, I don't think you, you shouldn't get any errors, but you should definitely create a home partition. So 80 and uh, yeah, sure. Why not? 80 GB. I'm pretty sure it's not going to need a space there. Excellent. Also, you will notice that it doesn't actually obey me to the fullest of extents. It creates a, I've told it 80, and it has created 74.51. Anyway, that's just how it works. So I have a bit of available space left here, and I figured, uh, why not? Let's create a swap partition. So swap, actually, you don't need to create it. Uh, I think I mentioned this, but it's not a bad idea to have it. You're not going to get an error message, but you're going to you're gonna get a warning message, let's put it so. Anyway, I didn't put in any size parameters, so it just took pretty much all that it could take. There is like one megabyte that's gonna be left there. I suppose you can try tweaking and <laughs> being extremely precise and trying to extract this uh, one megabyte, but honestly, why bother? Anyway. I uh, can put in a label here, you can name it any way you like as well. Add no problems there. 
swap will only act as a, usually you put it twice the size of RAM, but I mean on modern systems you don't really need it, primarily because you're not going to run out of RAM, generally, but you might, and then uh, your system actually starts using your portion of your hard drive as as it would use RAM. It's, it's a really slow procedure, uh, the method is terrible, but hey, it saves the day when all is taken into consideration. Anyway, I'm just going to click here, uh, I got home, boot, root, swap, I'm going to say done. And here I get a summary of changes, I get a type, and what's going to be destroyed, what's going to be created. Just have a look at this and make sure none of these disks are, are reserved for your Windows. So you can see by SDB, if, if any of them was SDA, cancel this immediately but no, they're all SDB. Excellent, so it's the second physical hard drive. They're usually SDB, SDA, I think the next one should be SDC, and so on and so forth, depending on how many you have. So here it says what's gonna be created, what's gonna be destroyed, what's gonna be formatted, etc. So let's just go ahead and click on Accept Changes. And there you go, custom partitioning selected, all is ready and the installation may actually begin. So you just click on begin, inst uh, begin installation. I didn't connect it to the network, but it doesn't really matter. We can do all the updates and all the things later on that we actually want since we will need to install some software and perform the updates as well. Anyway, I shall leave you here and later on I'll just show you that this, how the system boots and how and what is the difference between uh, how do you how do you actually select to boot into Windows and how do you actually select to boot into Red Hat? Anyway, until then, I bid you farewell. Welcome back, everybody. Now I'm just going to go ahead and show you that the installation did actually go through as planned. So here is the here is the machine, and now I'm just going to click on reboot. This is going to take a bit of time. I will later on to the machine that we're going to be using as our main operating system, as our Red Hat virtualized environment. I will assign far more resources there. I'll even assign more CPU cores and more RAM uh, so that it works faster. But for the time being, let's just see how this works in a bit of a slower mode. So you might have noticed that even though I've clicked reboot at the end of the Red Hat installation, I am booting now into Windows 8.1. And you might think this to be an error or something of a kind, but I assure you it is not. Everything is working as it should be working. Just type in test. Or oh, wait for it. Okay, now Windows is notorious for only seeing the partition of NTFS and XFAT. But let's just give it a shot anyway to see if we can actually see uh, the Red Hat partitions there. So type in disk management. Thank you very much. And then I'll restart the computer and show you that you can indeed boot into Red Hat without any bigger problems, but you need to click a button in time. Okay, so it does see VirtualBox edition. Okay, so CD disk one. Okay, yeah, there we go. So disk zero and disk one, they are the same size, and it just recognizes these partitions as healthy primary partitions, nothing more. It even sees only two, which is kind of weird, but okay. Anyway, don't pay that much attention to disk zero, primarily because I've done so many wrong things to it. Up to this point of time, I'm actually even surprised that it's working properly. What I want to show you here is the disk zero and how is it working. Anyway, if you need to free up some space here in the disk management while I'm here, I might as well show you. You can you can actually shrink these volumes. You cannot. You shouldn't mess around with these that are not Windows partitions. You should only mess around with Windows partitions in Windows. In Linux, you can mess around with pretty much anything. But let's just uh, right-click on it, and there is a delete volume, delete volume, uh, shrink volume. Okay. So you can right-click and shrink it 
Let's querying volume for available shrink space. Anytime now, my good man. Anytime. I don't know, I've already shrink I've already shrank it, so to say, something here and I have partitioned it. And here, excellent. So here it says shrink volume C size available to shrink in megabytes is actually zero because it can't get any smaller. And the amount of space to shrink in megabytes you would just put in here. Once that is done, you just uh, read the total size in megabytes after shrink and click shrink. There you go. You can only shrink them from left to right. You cannot shrink them from right to left. So one thing to keep in mind. Anyway, while I, while I was here, I figured I might as well show you that, although not particularly relevant for the course, but a bit of extra information is always in handy. Anyway, I just want to show you that these two partitions are in fact in existence. They are very much there, but Windows doesn't have a clue actual as to what they actually are. So I'll just go ahead and close this. Uh, as you would do with your normal machine with your physical machine let's just restart and now in the restart process once the windows goes down we will switch to red hat so press f12 to select the boot device you will have something similar in your machine i don't know it depends from which machine i have a dell so for dell it's f12 uh there are some other machines like it's f2 somewhere it's somewhere it's actually the delete button it will be written on the screen as soon as you turn the machine on this that first uh, black screen so don't worry about it just have a look at it and uh, it, it's gonna say like this is for BIOS this is for boot options select the one press the key for boot options and you will get something similar to this so either you will choose with an up and down arrow and then press enter or you will have numbers and letters like I have here so I'm just gonna say boot from hard disk and there you go. I have Red Hat here standing by. I also have Ubuntu down here, but disregard that, please. Uh, been messing around with uh, Windows and been trying to dual boot it in a single partition. Have encountered a lot of problems and didn't want to burden you with it. That's why it actually sees the Ubuntu here. But in any case, disregard that. You will not see that uh, upon when you install it. Rather, instead, you will only see these two options that I am switching in between. Now, select the first one, press enter, and very shortly Red Hat will actually boot. So you will have dual boot setup uh, working, no problems. As far as I could find on the forums and in consultation with a lot of people on the net who, are, who know a great deal about this, and after reviewing a lot of forum posts, as I've said before, I've actually opted for this method uh, to physically separate Windows and uh, Linux disks, and then you would just boot, select the boot options at machine startup. Safest way to go about things without actually messing up anything. So anyway, accept the license agreement, done, finish configuration, and it's going to boot any moment now. Come on. Uh, no, I would like to register at a later time because I don't want to register twice. I've already registered on a different machine. So it's booting into. This is the first boot, so keep that in mind. Excellent, there we go. Let's just log in. I'm not going to bother installing VirtualBox guest editions here, primarily because there's no need to do so. As we're not actually going to be using this machine, this is only a demonstration of the procedure itself. Oh, come on any time now. Mm, just want to show it to you as proof. There you go. So it did indeed boot. Uh, you ha now have the working the working environment, the graphical user interface here, and it works no problems. The if you want to switch back to Windows, just reboot the machine, uh, press the key, press the key on your keyboard that is appropriate to your computer. To your computer brand and select the hard drive from which you wish to boot. So one hard drive will be for Windows and another one will be for Red Hat. Very simple procedure, not too complex and the only thing that you could possibly mess around with, the only possible thing that you could uh, do that would cause you damage is to actually select the wrong drive during the partitioning uh, part of the installation and delete the Windows partition. So just be careful with that and all should go well, 
in any case I would like to cut the tutorial here and in the next one we will actually start using Red Hat and I will introduce you to the graphical user interface not only of Red Hat but GNOME. GNOME is the general graphical user interface for Linux distributions and then we'll move on slowly into the command line. Anyway, until then, I bid you all farewell. Welcome everybody to this tutorial. Uh, today I'm just going to go ahead and enter Red Hat. We're not going to do any more installations or anything of a kind. Today we're jumping in, but we're jumping, we're easing it in slowly. First, I want, I'm going to show you the graphical user interface and then we will move on to the terminal. I first want to sh show you where is what approximately. Before I do all of that, I have made some alterations to the Red Hat Virtual Machine. I have just assigned it more resources and you can do the same by clicking on the sy uh, settings and then going to system and you have the motherboard, processor, acceleration. And these things you can only change while the machine is down. So when, once you power the machine up, these changes can no longer take effect. You see, it's, I cannot do anything here. I need to turn the machine off, then make these changes. But in any case, you can see that I have assigned it uh, almost 3 gigs of RAM, and I have assigned it an extra process a CPU core. Hopefully, it's going to run a bit faster, and this is going to be a lot smoother experience. You can do the same if you wish, but it's not required. I'm simply doing this. Uh, to save on time. It is not a pre-requirement of what we are about to do. Anyway, just go ahead. I'm just going to go ahead and cancel that, minimize this, and have a look at this desktop. Uh, it's if some of you have used Mac, it's fairly similar to if it's fairly similar to it. In the upper on the upper bar, you have Sound, Network Manager, Power Management, Date, Username, or you can put in your real name there if you wish. And on the left side over here, you have applications and places. So let's click on places. Okay, capture it. Let's click on places. So it can it can take you home, uh, documents, downloads, music, pictures, videos, pretty much uh, similar as in Windows. You can even browse the network if you want, but doesn't really. Uh, we're not going to do that for now. Anyway, once you go into applications, uh, for all of you Windows users out there, this is basically like the start menu. You just click on it, and then you have pretty much everything that you want here. You have the Firefox, we have the browser, which is the default one is Firefox, of course. And we're going to see. Ah, don't open it, my good man. Never mind, let's just, uh, while it's opening it up for the first time, it's probably going to want to do some updates or something of a kind. Speaking of which, we need to do them as well, but first, let me just introduce you. So you have the Firefox browser here, you have the mail, mail client, uh, some, basically this is for music. For photos, you have LibreOffice, which is the equivalent of Microsoft Office. You can pretty much do anything in LibreOffice that you can do in Microsoft Office as well. So no problems there. And fi under files, if you're wondering what this is, this is actually a file manager. So let's just go ahead and click on it to see what comes up. Excellent. So this is our file manager. And let's just kill this red gigantic thing in the background. Close them. Most of, them, most of our time we will be spending uh, at the command line and we will be mostly dealing with the terminal. But it's good to know, it's good to have a look at these things and it's good to actually be at least acquainted with the graphical user interface if nothing else. As it is a prerequisite for using it as a desktop machine but not a prerequisite as using uh, for servers or anything of a kind. Which we eventually want to be able to manage, control, install and so on and so forth. Anyway, this is your file browser and you can pretty much go anywhere from here. If I go down to computer, it's going to take me uh, to where some of the system files are. I cannot access where the system files are. I cannot access some of them. You see there's an X here on root. If I double click on it, it says the location could not be displayed. You do not have the necessary permissions to view the contents of root. This is going to be a similar case in all, pretty much the same case actually, in all Linux distributions. You will not be able to access certain parts of it or see it unless you have a root password or unless you are using a terminal to actually view it. 
which is very nice, primarily because it disables 99% of viruses out there, pretty much, because they cannot do anything on your system without proper permissions. So anyway, you have the temporary files. Uh, I don't know, you have the root files. And here under var, you have the log files somewhere. I'll just uh, have a look at them. I've, I'm generally not used to doing this via graphical user interface, but let's just have a look at it. So log, excellent. So you have these log files that you can later on read. Don't worry about it. We will go through them. We will read them. I will explain to you this in greater, in far, far, far greater detail. For now, I'm just introducing you to the graphical user interface, nothing else. So just go ahead and close this and go back to applications. And now you have categories of applications. So you have favorites. And these really are pretty much the most used applications in uh, pretty much any Linux distro terminal and Firefox and browser. They are the first two and then go, comes the rest. So under accessories, I don't know, you have some stupid things that you would use for your daily affairs. Oh, by the way, the equivalent of Notepad uh, in Linux, I would definitely say that it's gedit except it has like a ton load of more capabilities and options. Uh, there we go, definitely. But we're not, uh, we're, we can use it a little bit later on, but we'll mainly be using text editors in the terminal. So you can just go ahead and close that. If we go further down below, okay, so documentation, graphics, nothing there. Oh, come on, internet. Okay, so nothing there, eh, excellent. Under Office. So here you have like LibreOffice Writer, which is uh, Word or LibreOffice Impress. I think that's um, uh, the one for presentations in the Office package. I'm pretty sure that you know to which I am referring to a PowerPoint. Tip of my tongue, but couldn't really remember. So LibreOffice Impress is basically PowerPoint, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, LibreOffice Draw, I think it's an equivalent of Paint or something of a kind. And LibreOffice Calc which is basically Excel. If we go down uh, further below, we got sound, video. Okay, so Cheese is for your webcam. Just so you know, you can utilize your webcam with Cheese. Barreso is for burning CDs, but we can do you, all of these. Uh, you can burn CDs through via the terminal as well without any sort of problems. Uh, if we go down below, Sundry. Okay, so we got SC Linux troubleshooter. Print settings, not that important. Uh, firewall, excellent. So you have the graphical user interface for the firewall. And if we go ahead and click on it, we're going to be prompted with a root password that's going to... Oops, actually, no. Are you serious? And if I select this... I oh, know, okay, there will, be a, there will be a root password. That would be hilarious if there wasn't anything here. I would see if if it didn't prompt me for a root password, then I could do pretty much whatever I wanted to the firewall. I would disavow. Uh, I would completely disavow Red Hat completely and utterly. Anyway, here you can, but fortunately, it does require the password. Here you can pretty much do anything with the firewall, and firewall in Linux is open source. Its capabilities are practically infinite. You can do whatever you want with it. There is pretty much nothing that you would need that you cannot do with a Linux firewall. It's amazing. I don't know, I'm sure you can find something and make me eat my own words, but uh, you get the general idea. So you can decide what services do you want to allow, uh, what ports, uh, you got port forwarding, ICMP filter, this is for pinging, and so on and so forth. But look, uh, all of this we will do later via the terminal as that is the proper way of doing this, because on a server you don't have a graphical user interface and you have to do with what you have. Primarily because graphical user interfaces are resource expensive and you don't, they waste RAM, they waste CPU, and you don't want them plus all the power rests in, on, in the terminal, the almighty terminal. Anyway, so go back to applications, uh, sundry. We were here. SC Linux is your, how shall I put this? Is your, let's say, antivirus system or a way of tightening down security eternally. We will deal with that later on as it will uh, present, as it will play a major role in this course. 
Uh, if you go down to system tools, uh, you got settings, boxes, and a lot of things here, but I'm going to continue talking about that in the follow-up tutorial, as I am running a bit of short on time here, and there are a few things to which I wish to introduce you here as well, just so you know that you can access them this way as well, and more often than not, on a desktop you will need to as well. Until then, I bid you farewell. Welcome back everybody, let's just continue. So in the application section, go down to system tools and here you have like a lot of interesting things. So for example, you have a system monitor, which is a very nice utility and we'll show you an equivalent of it in the terminal, which people do tend to use quite often. Uh, so you have file systems, you can take a look at them. They are listed here. Yep, there we go. So run media, random guy, VBox, guest editions. That is the mount point of my guest editions. So that one is used 100%, which is <laughs> which is the way it's supposed to be. But you can also see pretty much everything else. Let's go into processes. Here you can take a look at all the processes that are currently running on your system. If there was anything, well. After a while, I know it seems when you look at it like this, kind of complicated and you don't know what is what and you wouldn't be able to tell apart a malicious thing from a benevolent thing. Over the course of time, over when you start using it, when you learn about it, uh, when you use it on a daily basis or something of a kind, and you pass the Red Hat certification for a system administrator, Eventually, you just need to take a look at this once and you pretty much know what each one of these things does uh, or you, in 99% of the, or in those 1% of the cases out of 99%, uh, you have a vague idea of what that process is and then you can figure it out from there. But believe me, people can just glimpse at this and pretty much know what each one of these does relatively fast with relative ease. Anyway. In addition to that, you got the user that's running those processes, a random guy, that is me, that is my username that I have created, yours is probably different, you, I hope I hope to God that you didn't copy mine, I strongly urge you to type in whatever you wish. And in addition to that, we have the amount of resources that our current, uh, that our current processes are consuming, so you can see most of them are pretty much idle. Uh, but this one, the GNOME shell, is consuming 32% of the CPU, has this ID, which can be used to actually kill the process, and then we have uh, 573, what is this? Megabytes, I think. Hold on. Let me just expand it. Yep, it's 573 megabytes of RAM, which is a fairly expensive process in comparison to pretty much everything else that is running here. However, there are there are better tools which you, we will use in the terminal and that will uh, give you better overview of the entire situation, but know that this exists. Okay, so let's just close it, go back to our place, uh, system tools, and there we go. So it says Red Hat Subscription Manager. You can configure your subscriptions here if you want other sort of registrations. Uh, what I really want to do is go ahead and click on software. And here you can actually uh, search for different sort of packages, which is a backup client, let's see, just select it. And this is a basically a graphical user interface for the installation of various packages of various software programs, etc. So you can pretty much find whatever is in the repositories here. However, people don't tend to use this one as it is a GUI. But again, another one of those things that you should know that it exists. And all those, uh, for example, on Windows, on Android, and on Mac, you know how they say, oh, it's amazing, you have this store, and you go there, and you then, you can download software immediately from there. Well, let me just tell you, Linux had that from the very beginning. Like, from the very beginning. Well, maybe not the first Linux that ever came out, but it's pretty close, I'm sure of it. Pretty much, people have just been pulling software from the official repositories for as long as I know. So long before Windows, long before uh, Apple, Mac OS X, and long, definitely long before Android, Linux had repositories from which people always kept on pulling software to install onto their machines, as it is a fairly secure way 
of doing that as all that software that is there is checked by uh, the repository maintainers. Anyway, it's a very nice thing to have, but we're going to use a terminal one, which is fairly simple to use. It's called yum, and I will show you definite and I will show you fairly well how to use it. You will become proficient with it, so you don't have to worry about it. Another thing here is the system log. Now, even though most people tend to do these things in the terminal, the system log here, the tool, it gives you a rather nice overview of the things. So if you just type, you do, you do require a, path, a root password in order to review the logs, as is to be expected. So you have a various processes here, of various things that have happened. You have their logs and you can see what is going on. This is especially important for troubleshooting. I would even argue that this is better than the terminal as it gives a bit of a better overview of the existing logs and then you can just scroll through them and see what is going on. Generally people take a look at messages and what was going on in general with the system itself. You just scroll up and down and take a look at these lines. They don't mean much to you now, but uh, they will. They will in time. Just just show a bit of patience. You can't know everything from if in like five minutes you cannot learn everything. That's that's for sure. Just a little bit of patience and you will eventually become proficient. Okay, so yeah, this is another thing that I want that I'm going to show you fairly soon, but for the time being, let's just stick to what we have. Uh, system tools again. So you have startup applications. Here you can configure cron jobs, if I'm not mistaken. Well, you can configure cron jobs via the terminal, but here you can also use a graphical user interface to just say, okay, I want this application to run at startup, and I want this one, and I want this one, or I don't want that one, I don't want this one. So here you can actually create your own scripts and link them here. Just name it whatever you want, then you browse it in the file system, you find it, just double click on it. it, the command will be here and then you can even comment it if you want. That script will run at startup. This is a very common thing uh, for system administrators to have plenty of scripts that will run at startups. They usually carry a USB stick with them with like 10,000 scripts on it. Every particular script has its own thing. Usually those are troubleshooting tools that people make for themselves. Uh, I don't know, to filter, to filter certain traffic out or to uh, boot certain services, to kill certain services, to start certain services, sorry, not boot, and to display certain files or to display certain logs and to see the status of certain things. Anyway, uh, that's pretty much it as far as uh, this part is concerned. Perhaps one more thing is Red Hat Access and Boxes is actually for accessing other machines, so we won't need that at the time being, but it can be nice. You can use Red Hat Access to connect to their network from your directly from your operating system, and have a look if you can see if you can find anything useful there. But we shall deal more with these things a bit later on here. I'm just giving you a bit of intro. Down at the utilities, there are some very, fairly nice things. So Archive Manager can unpack pretty much anything. You know how in Windows you have to actually have, I mean you have to download an unzip software. I, Seven Zip is free. But you have RAR or you have WinRAR or something of a kind that you have to pay for. Uh, here in Linux, you can pretty much unpack anything for free, no problems. Got a lot of things here. Uh, well, dictionary is not particularly useful to us at the moment. You get a disk usage analyzer, not bad. Uh, font document. Okay, so remote desktop viewer is very nice. It comes free. You can utilize it, no problems. Uh, to access computers remotely and provide technical support. That can be very nice. You don't need to install anything extra there. Uh, up here, you got disks. So let's just open up a, our disks. And there we go. We got pretty much everything uh, listed here. So it's 137 gigabytes hard disk. This is probably the Windows one, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, no, 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 sorry. This is XFS Linux bootable. Down below, we got some other Red Hat 2.7 gigabyte block partition. I don't exactly know what this is, but okay, so 80 block uh, device. This should be home. Yep, there we go. So Red Hat home. Let's just see what 
this is ah oh this is swap there we go so we can read it here uh, it's swap and up here it's root so you can figure out how you you can review your partitioning scheme here without bigger problems by just clicking it's fairly simple to read through it without any bigger difficulties you can also well, create a disk image restore a disk image you can benchmark it uh, it provides a wide variety of options for you to play around with I'll just go back to utilities to see if I've actually missed anything. Nope, that would be it. Okay, so there is one more thing that I want to show. Oh, sorry, uh, utilities. Sorry, action overview. Excellent. So if you go to action overview, you're going to be prompted with this. And on the right side, you have your virtual desktop. So you can have multiple things and multiple desktops. That's for That can be very nice, uh, primarily because it's a space saver. So you can just switch between them. We'll probably do that later on as we progress. Uh, here at the, to at the top center, you have a search box. So you can type in um, the approximate name of any application. So termin there we go. So terminal. OK, so let's try something else. Barreso. No, I have a feeling I misspelled it. So, ah, there it Bra Bracero, sorry, Bracero, that's how it's read. I misread it because I don't use Bracero, I use uh, the KD one, but it doesn't really matter. I want to show you something new and something a bit different. Anyway, you can do this in the terminal, as I have said, but this is how you would search for things in your GUI interface. So you could actually find them. You don't need to know the file system by heart. You can just use the search functionality here and figure out where is what and how to find things. This is your sidebar on the left side. You see you have Firefox here and some other things. This can be changed by a simple drag and drop. Uh, fairly simple. You can even show the applications like this. Uh, frequent or all. And now you can just scroll down. So this has been implemented for a while now. And I, I have I mean, if you have a touch screen or something like that, this I bet this could work really well. But anyway, down here at the bottom is our number one program, the holy grail of power, uh, the terminal. So let's just go ahead and open it. With this, I shall conclude today's lecture. In the next lecture, we will start using the terminal. I hope that you have familiarized yourself with this desktop layout at least to an extent to see where is what and what can you do where because I remember when I was uh, starting to learn uh, when I was figuring out how Linux works and coming from Windows the graphical user interface was completely unclear to me so I went around I learned I scowled and so on and so forth even though I should have probably learned the terminal first but over the time you learn how to use the terminal, you learn how to use the command line. It is important to know how to do things in GUI primarily because that is your second that is your reserve option. So if you don't know how to do it in uh, via terminal at the in the beginning in the very beginning while you're still lear learning, uh, just go ahead and use the GUI. Don't waste more than an hour on something. If it doesn't if you can't figure it out, oh well do it in a GUI and then come back in the terminal especially the firewall settings and stuff like that, that is quite delicate and you need precise commands to know exactly what's going on, to know exactly what sort of traffic are you allowing to pass and what sort of traffic are you not allowing to pass. In any case, as I said in the follow-up tutorial, we're going to jump straight into the terminal, so be ready. Until then, I bid you all farewell. Welcome everybody to this tutorial. Today I will begin using the command line interface, but before I do, let me just share a few things with you from my own personal experiences with the command line. First of all, it can seem a little bit complicated, especially to Windows users, and in the beginning it might seem like you will never be able to learn it or something of a kind, but believe me, that is not the case. Thousands of people, millions of people have learned it before you who had the exact same mindset. I don't want you to worry about that. If it seems complicated or if you make mistakes or if something doesn't work immediately, don't worry about it. It happens to everybody. Most important of all, do not get frustrated by it. If you do get up, 
go make a cup of coffee, drink a cup of water, go for a walk, whatever, make a five minute break, uh, whatever uh, calms you down, do it because if you are frustrated, you won't be able to do it, you won't be able to do much, I guarantee it to you. Anyway, if you just stick with it, by the end of this course, you will master the Linux command line and you will successfully uh, be able to use Red Hat without any problems. You will have full knowledge uh, of, the com of the terminal in Red Hat and you will command it to the fullest of extents. You will be able to do whatever you want with it without any bigger difficulties. But as I said, if there are problems along the way, and there will be problems along the way, if you encounter bumps, uh, don't stop, just stick with it, and eventually you will figure it out of that, I assure you. It is not as complicated as it seems, it's very simple, straightforward, no problems. Anyway, that being said, let's just go ahead and click on application, move on down to utilities, scroll to the bottom, and there is a terminal icon here, we're just going to go ahead and click it. Excellent. So I have already changed my terminal here to an extent, but if you just go ahead and click on edit and you say profile preferences, here you can do here you can customize it to a good extent. So I have my pro there are just a few things that you need to customize here. Other than that, you can just leave as it is. So profile name, it's random guy. That's my username for this account. So I have changed the profile name to ran random guy. It will probably be by default untitled or something of a kind, but even if you don't change it, it won't make any significant differences. Down below, this will be ticked, so use system fixed with font, and if you untick this, you will be able to select a custom font for you, and you will be also be able to configure the font size, which is very nice. So if I say 20, this is going to get even bigger. I'm probably going to say 22 for the purposes of this tutorial. I, I generally wouldn't use it, but I want you to be able to see everything that goes on here. Down below, you have the cursor shape. So just take a look at the terminal in behind at the top and see how the block changes to an I-beam and then how it changes to an underline. I personally like to use a block. You can use either of the three, which any of the three, whichever suits your needs or preferences. You can also configure the default terminal size. Uh, you can resize it basically now to anything you want with an arrow with your mouse. However, this default terminal size refers to the f every time you open up a terminal. What size do you want it to be then? But after you have opened it up, you can change it to whatever you want. Anyway, the next thing that I want to configure is colors. So under colors, you can say what sort of scheme do you want? It says use colors from the system theme. Do you want that? No, I do not want that. Okay, I generally choose blue on black. For this particular tutorial, I've chosen green on black. I think you'll be able to see things a lot better that way. Uh, but you can choose whatever you want. So you'll look, uh, here you have text color. You can choose your text color to be anything. It can be yellow or whatever this color is and look it changes in the background no problems it can be uh, is this crimson or red ah, this is red okay so oops I just changed the color plate sorry let's just put it red here and you can see that it immediately changes but I'm just gonna go ahead and select was it this green or this green select yep it was this one Excellent. So I'm just going to go ahead and select this one here. Okay. So bold color. No, I don't want bold color to be that. Sorry. We'll just cancel same as the text color. Don't 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 alter that. I thought for a moment it was something different. So the bold color is basically bold letters. What sort of uh, what sort of color do you want for that kind of text or something of a kind, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, down below you have built-in schemes. So you can, I don't know, use different ones. There's like the Linux console or, I don't know, Tango. I've honestly never used that one or Xterm. I don't know, I really wouldn't use that one either. You have the color plate down here, which you can play around with. 
if you want, but there really there really is no literally no need for you to do that. You can just say custom and then choose whatever you want. But there is not even a need to play with the palette at all. You can change color of different things there, but no need. You're just gonna confuse yourselves. Rather instead just change the text color and the background color to whatever suits you. I would personally recommend that you change it to something that is suiting for your eyes. Anyway, do we have anything here? Okay, yes, the scroll bar. How many lines do you want to be able to scroll back to? This is a pretty good thing, actually. It might not seem important or something of a kind, but more often than not, you will want to scroll back and you will want to see that you, what have you done or what has been done. So it's not a bad to keep this number high. I think 8192 is plenty, so there's no need to change that but sometimes it's a good idea to click on unlimited although all these things cost resources compatibility okay so no need to change anything actually here by default this is all fine title and command this is all also fine you can run some additional scripts or something of a kind custom made says run a custom command instead of my shell don't change that just leave it as it is there is not there's no real reason to change anything here we will be changing things in the terminal anyway if you want something to run on boot up we will place it in the cron job in the cron tab and there things will run you don't need to put anything here or anything of a kind anyway I'll just go ahead and close this uh, expand the terminal across the board and I'm gonna switch to full screen Okay, so capture. Okay, there we go. So it's across the full, it's across the whole screen, and now we can begin with some basic concepts. So first of all, let me introduce you to the CD command. See, CD it stands for Change Directory. With it, you are able to navigate the file system. In a sense, I can now CD to home you can type in two letters, two, three letters, or even one, and then press tab to complete it. Here, observe. You can type in cd slash stands for root. So this is the root of the directory. You can see that uh, this part here has changed from this to this. Excellent. So if, as I said, if I type in cd space slash and I type in h tab, it immediately completes and it says it's home. It knows how to go there. And then inside of home, I have my username, which is random guy. I can just type in R and then press tab again, and it's going to auto complete the whole command. So sometimes you need to type in more than one uh, letter or press tab twice. There you go. So it completed. Just go ahead and clear that. So CD. If I slash home it's gonna complete and if I even don't type anything in here because there's only one possibility if I press tab it's gonna finish and it's gonna type in random guy the username and if I type in tab again nothing's gonna happen but if I type it twice really fast actually I've typed it in thrice here but doesn't really matter you are able to see from here you see this is the command I've typed in tab twice tap tw tab twice and now I got a list of possible uh, folders that I could navigate to, directories actually, that I could navigate to. Very simple, and if I type in capital T, that's for templates. Is there anything else with a T? Nope, there is, okay, let's use the P. So there are two things with P as far as I can see, it's pictures and public. If I type in tab, nothing, but if I type it uh, again, it's pictures and public. So it gives me the two possibilities very easy way of navigating through the entire file system but you might ask yourselves how does he know where to go that's a pretty good question actually and we use the we use our pre-existing knowledge of course but we also use another set another command which help us helps us navigate and figure out where we are at the moment now before I go into that there is this command which I've used previously it's uh, it's called clear it's spelled like this and if you type it into the terminal, it's going to clear pretty much everything that is there. You see, I, ju I just typed in clear, and it literally does what it says. 
what the, what the name says it does. It clears the screen completely, it clears the terminal. Quite in handy, very helpful to stay neat, stay uh, in focus with what you are doing at the moment. Now, there is this command ls. If I press it, you see it lists the. If I just type in ls without adding any arguments of whatsoever, it's going to list all the folders and all the files, and it's going to list pretty much everything within my current working directory. Uh, it's not going to give me the hidden files, but you don't really need those at the moment. I will explain shortly what those are and how you can see them. But if I just type in ls, it's going to show me everything in my current working directory. So if, for example, if I want to go to boot, dev, bin, etsy, home, lib, whatever, I would type in cd space etsy, press enter. And then I would type in ls again, and you see I have a whole ton load of, of files here, folders, uh, files here, directories, and so on and so forth. I have a lot of stuff here in general. So let's just go ahead and clear. You will too. But there is another key thing with this uh, cd command. Actually, there are a few shortcuts that you can use, and there is one key thing. So let's just go back to root directory. To go back to root directory, you just type in cd space slash. Uh, this, this is pretty much the same concept that is uh, on Unix, Linux type systems. That also is the same concept that works on a BSD or on Mac. The only operating system that this concept is not valid. Uh, the, the command cd is, but the concept of a slash is not on Windows. So Windows machines would use something like this, a backslash. This would be uh, this would be their point of reference. This would be how they would navigate. Backslash, so you would say, I don't know, program uh, files, and then backslash, I don't know, uh, something here. Something, and then again, random stuff. Anyway, this is how they would navigate. This is how you would navigate in Windows with backslashes and then uh, typing in the whole path. Also, the tab option that I've showed you a moment ago works a bit differently there as well. Let's just go ahead and clear the screen and see. Oops, I don't need to because you can also see where you are here. It's going to tell you generally uh, where you are in this section that I have selected now. So slash just represents root. But look at this. I can cd to home and let's say I'm in home and let's say that I want to go exactly actually let's go to random guy and then clear and let's say I want to go exactly one step one step backwards how would you do that you you don't want to type in cd and then root and then home and then you would go back there okay in this particular example it's relatively simple but you could be somewhere deep in the file structure and to type this path in again can be a bit tedious. Just to go one step backward, it's not very practical. So, uh, symbol for the previous directory is dot dot. If I type in dot dot, I'm going to go back one directory. I can go back again, so cd dot dot. See, I'm going backwards. Uh, the current directory is cd uh, dot. Well, there wouldn't be a point type in cd dot, but the markation for the current directory is a dot. Anyway, another thing that you can type in is after you have cleared uh, is pwd print working directory. So if I press enter, okay, so it's root. If I cd home, pwd, I'm in home now. So to clear, cd random guy, clear, uh, pwd, I am in home, ran, root home random guy. Excellent. So if I type in cd dot dot, and again pwd, you can see that this path here, that this, uh, not path, but this uh, current working, di working directory is different from this one. It's different by exactly one single step here. And that is the dot dot, which signifies the previous working directory. Simple as that, you go forward, you go backward, you go forward, you go backward. 
very simple to navigate. There will be a few more things uh, in regard to the CD command in the follow-up tutorial as this will be a mini-series within this uh, course where we shall learn the basics of the terminal, how to use it, what commands you need on your day, what command, what what basic commands and more advanced commands and stuff of a kind and then later on we will get into the actual stuff that you will need for the Red Hat Certified Administrator exam but you cannot really do any of those things without learning these fundamental basics. Anyway, I bid you farewell and I hope to see you in the next tutorial. Welcome back everybody. Let's just continue. So the last time we used the change directory command and there is a there are a few tricks to it. One of them is basically using this markation. So if I type in this and if I press enter, okay, I'm already in that directory. But let's say that I was in root boot grub to I don't know whatever. Unless, yep, I am there. Anyway, how would I get back to my home directory where my username is? What would I do? What would I need to type in? Well, one of the first things that comes to mind is cd slash home slash random guy and I would be there. And if I want to go to the downloads folder, I would have to get, type in down, downloads. So this whole command would, I would need to type in in order to go back to my home directory. Is there a shorter way? Yes. So basically there is a shortcut. I know it doesn't seem too significant here, but when you are deep somewhere in the system, deep on the file tree, uh, typing in these commands to go back and forth can be a tedious task and knowing these shortcuts can help you a great deal to well, basically preserve your nerves and save time. So just type in uh, tilde, there you go, slash, and if I type in downloads, there you go. I'm going to go straight into the downloads folder from here, or I could just type in uh, this. There you go, if I type pwd, I indeed am in my home directory of the current user. Keep in mind that the cd tilde will only take you to the current home directory of uh, sorry, not to the current home directory, there is no such thing, uh, to the home directory of the current user. So it won't take you to the, if you, for example, had, let's go back a step, let's do an ls. So this is my user, but you can have practically an infinite amount of users here. And if I typed in cd tilde, it would take me back, it would basically take me back only to this uh, to this folder as that is my current user name. This is my host name. So this is the host name here and this is my username just so you know what is signified here and this is my current directory so to say the entire path is not listed but the current one the current the name of the current directory is which is very very nice. Let's go ahead and clear the screen and let's go back to the ls command. Now ls command has a large amount of arguments. So what are arguments to commands? Basically it's an additional instruction that you give a, a, to a command which modifies the way that particular command behaves. So if I just type in ls, oh well let's change directory to root because I'm gonna have more stuff to list there and if I type in ls here Okay, so you see what happens? I get a list of directories in this fashion, but that's that's about it. I get a list of not just directories, I get a list of everything that is within this directory, which is root. But so what? It doesn't tell me any information. It doesn't tell me the size. It doesn't tell me the last date when it was modified. It doesn't give me the permission. It doesn't give me the ownership. Nothing. Okay, let's try to change that. Let's type in ls space dash l. So this L dash L is an argument to a command which will modify its behavior. Press enter and there you go. You can see how this particular listing, oops, sorry, this particular listing is completely different from this listing. Why? Well, the lower listing or the later, the later listing uh, is far more verbose in comparison to the first one. It gives you a lot more information and it's really useful. So this is the basically the owner, this is the ownership group, size, ups, size, last date when it date 
last date when it was modified. Uh, the, now, how do you know? Is this a directory, or is this a text file, or something of a kind, or is this a file, or a directory, or whatever? So it says here, basically, the first letter, it says directory, D. The first letter, L, it's a link. Do we have anything that's not a link or directory here? I'm afraid we do not. Let's go into var plus dash L. Do we have anything here? Nope. Log. There's bound to be something here. And there we go. So if it's just a dash, basically like this, uh, it says secure, then you can go ahead and open it. It's basically a text file. It's basically a file. It doesn't necessarily have to be a text file. Everything is a file in Linux, but it's not a directory which contains other files. Let's put it so. Uh, let's open it up. There is another command which you can use. It's called less. I think I shall speak more about text editing commands and text display uh, and the commands which you can use for test displaying, but here I just want to demonstrate how you can confirm uh, that indeed it is not a directory, rather it's, oops, not Samba, secure, and instead it's, oops, what does it say? Permission denied. Hmm, what could that be? What could the reason be? It doesn't actually allow us to list the contents of the secure file of the file named secure what is the problem well let's take a look the owner of this file is root root group that is and the root user because the, this column here it tells you who the who the owner is which user is the owner and this colon here actually tells you uh, to which group which group does own that file two different things. Let me just explain this further to you. Let's say that a company has a Linux system running and that you have within that company management department management department, and you have accounting department. So there will be users in accounting department which would belong to an accounting group and there will be users in the management department that would belong to management group. So you would have, I don't know, Kevin Smith who belongs to where it says root here, you would have, I don't know, Kevin Smith, that belongs to the group accounting. You also have this group, which I am displaying here, which is root, that is fundamentally for control of all things on the system. Roots, root is the, pretty much, is almighty, there is nothing that is beyond the grasp of root. Anyway, let's just go ahead and clear the screen here. As I said, I will deal later on more with text editing commands and how you can create files, edit them, and less for the time being, I just want to show you the ls and explain it further. So ls-lh and a. Excellent, so what has changed? What can you notice that has changed in the output of this file? It says four kilobytes. Uh, four kilobytes again, 12 kilobytes. These files are pretty small. There's nothing in megabytes here to show, but it doesn't matter. This is basically a human readable format of file sizes. Look at the difference. Just okay. So how how easy is it to read this? Uh, you have to compute basically to figure out the file size. I mean, you know, it's pretty small here, so you can say it's four kilobytes. But I mean, imagine if it was. Imagine if four, if I don't know. 4.5 gigabytes were represented in kilobytes. That would be hilarious because you would have a huge number here and you would basically need to compute how much is that in gigabytes, which is absurd. Rather, instead, you can just add h to the ls command, the argument h, and you will immediately get the file sizes for pretty much all the files here. One more thing. Uh, you have a which enables you to list pretty much everything that there are no hit if there are some hidden folders they will be listed rest assured uh, you can also say that it omits these two if you want but that's that's not a big deal uh, rather instead this is your current directory it represents your current directory and this one it represents your it represents the directory which precedes this one so dot and double dot I've shown that with the CD command anyway Let's go ahead and clear the screen now 
and type in ls space dash dash help. This is a universal way to get more information on what a particular command does and what sort of arguments can you actually pass to that command. You can also try typing in dash h, but that's not going to work for ls. You see it just prints things. Uh, rather instead just type in dash dash help. Most of the commands will accept dash h, but dash dash help will be is more universal, let's put it so. If I press enter, I don't have a listing of the current directory, rather instead I have a help menu which pretty much gives me the list of all arguments, it tells me what each of those arguments does, and on top, let me just show you, on the top it gives me the example of usage. Very nice, right? So ls, and then I pass in the option, which is one of the arguments below, and you might notice that there is also a file here. So what could this mean? Let's have a look. But before we do, uh, I would strongly recommend to all of you these are these things are pretty simple. Uh, just feel free to read through this through some of them. You don't have to read through all of them. The the ones that you will be using on daily basis will be the a. Uh, hold on, the dash h of course. It's oops, the dash h which is right here. Also, you have the long version of the argument. So instead of dash h, you can also pass this long version of it. But I don't think that there is ever a need for such things. Uh, it doesn't act to not print group names to shorten the output if you want. Okay, so what else are we going to need? Du -du -du. Let's see if there's anything else. Ignore pattern. Different. Uh, du -du -du -du. There is, there is definitely something. Ah, th there we go. I knew I was looking for something that I wanted. Uh, dash R. It's basically recursive. So list subdirectories recursively. Now we're going to try to use that as it's going to come quite in handy. Look at what I'm going to do. So clear. If I type in from here ls tilde slash home. Uh, sorry, I don't need home. I'm already there. Uh, let's go to downloads. Yep, there we go. Downloads. And there is literally nothing there. Okay, forget about that. Let's go ls uh, just of the root directory and then type in var. Okay, so I have just told it to list the, co the contents of the directory var. Press enter, there we go. Even though my current working directory is var log, I have stated that I want the directory to be a list that some directory uh, should be the contents of some directory should be listed. So here you can actually specify a path direct to the directory you wish to see. So you can see the contents of any directory on the system from any location on the system as long as you have the proper permissions to do so. Let's try something else. Let's try ls uh, r slash boot. This is uh, this is going to give you a lot of information. Ups, 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 where is it, where is it, where is it? Ls, ls, uh, should be around here somewhere. There we go. So, there we go. Ls, space, dash r, for recursive output, space, path to the file, path to the directory. Okay, the first thing that it does, it gives me the listing of slash boot. Second thing that it does, it gives me the listing of slash boot grub2. And then it shows me what is in that directory. And then you see uh, grub the directory grub2 has a subdirectory of fonts. The next thing it does, it does boot grub2 and then fonts. And then it shows me the listing of that particular directory and so on and so forth into as long as there are subdirectories to the current directories. It shows the entire listing of pretty much everything. A fantastic way to go about things and you are able to see pretty much anything anywhere. Anyway, I shall call the tutorial here and then we will continue in the follow-up. Welcome everybody to this tutorial. Today I'm gonna go over a few more commands with you. The first one that we shall deal with is the command man. 
So man actually is basically a manual or man pages for a specific command. So for example, you can type in man ls and it's going to tell you everything that there is to know about the ls command. Sometimes the help the help uh, the help part of the command so ls dash dash help is not formulated to the best and you get a list of arguments but for example you don't get the description of what each one of those arguments does you only get the syntax of the command and how you should type it in but you don't really know how it actually what what will a certain argument do to the command how will it modify it man pages also have a help menu so if i just type in man dash help dash dash help you see that i have a lot of options here uh, most of these things are actually related to the search part to searching through man pages or to searching for the right portions of the man pages and formatting their output but I didn't really find it necessary over the course of the years to use most of these uh, basically man and a certain command will suffice anyway Aside from that, I would recommend that you just go ahead and read through them, just to see what options you have. You don't need to memorize them, as you always have them in the help bar, but just uh, just have a look at it, and that will be sufficient. It's a uh, it's a good thing to know how to use man pages, and just to know that they are there, so that you can refer to another source if the help menu doesn't actually suffice. Let's just go ahead and clear the screen. The next command which I wanted to deal with you is touch. Touch is used for creating files. And in combination with this, I will also teach you how you can actually search through your system for a certain file. Now usually there are two methods. One is preferred over the other. For example, uh, you have locate. And so very simple, plain English language. And you have find. Now locate is a lot faster than find but it does require the database to be updated and don't get intimidated right away uh, there is not the process of updating the database is basically one word command that's it. Anyway before we get into that let's just go ahead and see how touch works. So touch and let's say that I want to create file one. File one. So this is just a reference name that I'm creating you can basically smash your keyboard here and name your file. There are some limitations as to how you can name your file, but uh, generally you can pretty much name it to anything within, can, within pretty much anything that suits you. So let's uh, create, uh, let's use file one. Let's do it like this, file zero one. You can, and if I press enter and then if I list it, you can see that the file one zero one is there, but look, there is a shortcut to the ls. You'd, if you don't want to do this ls space dash l for the long listing, which is generally more preferable than just than just the ls, you can simply use the ll command. And if you use the ll command by default, you will be you will be given a long listing for that directory. LL works pretty much the same as LS, so you just type in LL. You can also specify a path, so let's say uh, the root, simple as that, and you can also say LL dash R dash root boot. You see, it gives a recursiveness here, so it works in the same way, except you just tab L twice and press enter and get a log listing. It saves you a ton load of time, trust me on that one. Anyway, we have created file one, but we can also create multiple files like this, as it is a rather fast way of doing that. So we just do touch, and you can also specify a directory where you want the files to be created. For example, I can go ahead and type in uh, oops, downloads, and then I can say, I don't know, file zero two. Oops downloads of, sorry, file 03, and then I can change the directory path. I can say, okay, now I want you to go to documents, and I'm going to say file, file, 
so I messed it up with a 0 03, I'm going to fix it shortly, I can say here file 0 04. So it gives you the ability to create files pretty much anywhere on your system where you have a permission via the single command line. Very useful. So we press enter and there we go. It has indeed created them. You can confirm it by doing the listings. So I'll downloads. There we go. So file 0, 2 and 0, 3. And you can see there's another file. It says find me. I have used it to conduct some tests previously. If I go ahead and type in uh, documents here you go you see that the file 04 is indeed there let's go ahead and clear the screen and deal with the subject of two more commands which is find and locate we're gonna deal with find first uh, you will use find only if you know where something is in specific you don't want to, you definitely don't want to use find uh, to search through your entire system because that's gonna take a while <laughs> not a not a pretty sight I can tell you that uh, not a pretty weight but here you go you can type in find that's why we use locate that uses a database that's much faster that can search through the entire system uh, at practically no time practically no time so just you type in find and then you're gonna specify the directory in which you want it to search you don't need to specify the directory you can just go ahead and type in your search pattern here with an argument, but rather instead I want it I want to specify a directory because it would be highly inefficient to actually just say go ahead and search through the whole system. Although sometimes you need to do that and that's why locate is so nice. I personally always use locate instead of find, but I just figured I would show it to you anyway. So let's say that I want to go into my home directory and there I will conduct a search. So if I type in name, then space quotation marks, I will say file 01. Search. Excellent. So it has found it relatively fast. It says home random guy file 01. It has been found indeed. But what if I did this? What if I change this letter to lowercase letter? Guess what? Nothing is found. It does not exist. Linux is case sensitive. I believe that I've mentioned this previously, if not, oh well. And two files uh, having the same name, the only difference being lowercase letters and uppercase letters, are two completely different names for the Linux system. So it is case sensitive to the point of extreme and you should all be very much aware of it. If you want to ignore the case, usual, the usual argument for the commands which deal with text formatting is dash i. So you just add dash i to the name and you see it has indeed found it. Usually dash i is to ignore something, generally, in all commands. Anyway, I could have just said uh, if I don't specify a folder path, it's gonna, oops, where, let's see where am I at the moment, so pwd. Okay, so I'm in home and random guy and if I just, and if I am in the current working directory where where the file is located and if I do this it's gonna find it but suppose I am not suppose I do go and change it to root oops what has happened here well first of all we have been issued permission denied for a ton load of folders if I do ll we are unable to access most of these folders as our current users, so the find will not even be able to look for them there. That's the first problem. The second problem is that even though it can access the home directory, it hasn't actually found it because only it is only looking here. There you go. So all of these things are permission denied, uh, permission denied, you are unable to access it. Be sure that you execute a find command from a place where you have access to other folders and their subfolders. Please be aware of that, otherwise you will not be able to actually execute find at all. You will just get the same error that I have gotten. So, here you go. I typed in find and it says iname and it says file 01 
Excellent. So it has immediately found it here in the home, even though I'm in my root directory, no problems. So it does jump in to the folders recursively, which is very nice. But look here where it tries to look for the file, it says permission denied, permission denied, permission denied. You cannot access these files or folders. And provided that your file is in one of those places, it will not be able to find it at all. That can be extremely problematic. That's why we need root permissions, uh, sudo and su. Later on we will deal with that, but for the time being I just want to show you this. Anyway, if I go ahead and clear the screen, there is another command which we can use, which is very nice. I, I personally prefer to use it. It's called locate. And if I just type in locate, so file 01, Oh, what is this? It hasn't found anything. What what could be the problem? Well, as I said, Locate uses a database, and that database is updated on daily basis, which is resource inexpensive but also inefficient. However, the beloved Linux creators and the Locate creators developers have left us with a very nice option here. It's called you just type in update update db press enter cannot open temporary file oh yeah okay so one more thing you cannot up you cannot do the update without the root permissions in order to obtain root permissions well there are you just type in su press enter type in your root password you're not going to see anything here it'll be blank this is done as a precautionary measure and of course I've typed in the wrong password you see, when I type in my password, nothing is shown. In Unix Linux-like systems, every time you type your password into the terminal, uh, usually 99% of the cases, the length of the password will not be shown. It will not show as though you're typing anything. Don't worry, it's not broke. It's just a security precaution so that if somebody's watching across your back, uh, over your back, they won't be able to see the length of the password on the screen, which is a very nice feature, and I would very much like for Windows to implement it as well although it is not really practical as I say you just have to get used to it because even though you're typing something you can't see anything on the screen I would also like some other services for example like Gmail or Amazon as well for cloud hosting and stuff like that to actually implement that version of authentication so that the passwords are so that the length the lengths of the password are not shown because if somebody has the length of your password uh, the amount of possible combination reduces drastically Anyway, now that we now that we are root, let's go ahead and clear the screen. So you can see that I am no longer random guy. I am root at this is my host name. I'm gonna change the host name later on, but for the time being, this is the one. So I am logged in now as root at this host name at this machine. Let's type in update db. Excellent. And let's type in locate again. So locate and what do we need? We need file zero one. There we go. It has found it immediately. But 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 look look look. You can type in dash dash help, and there is an ignore option here. There you go. Look, it is the same, exactly the same as with as with the find command. So dash i clear. Type in locate dash i uh, file zero, 0 1 okay let's kill the capital letter excellent so let's just change the, uh, the name a little bit more let's type in like this like this it's still gonna find it so no problems but let's say you don't know the whole name of the file you just know the fragment of the name or the portion of the name or something of a kind well, that can be problematic. So what you want to do is type in locate uh, dash i space, and here you can actually just type a fragment of the file name. So I don't know. Let's say it's wait. This is going to give me too much stuff, but let me just show you. So file. Look at how much stuff we got. And I don't want to sip through all of this, but I can assure you that the name is actually within this. 
whatever however you do need to actually filter it a little bit more so let's say underline and a zero there we go it has indeed found what we were what we were looking for and in addition to that what we were looking for it has also found anything else containing this particular pattern anyway the file is actually contained here as well somewhere God knows where but if you don't actually know anything if you just know a fragment of the name then you're actually going to have to manually sift through this unless you are able to learn more or guess more about the name of the file eventually if you sift through all of it you will find it God knows where somewhere I guess but you can immediately I mean, if you're looking for libraries or something of a kind, you generally know that they're in user share lib somewhere of a kind. Or if you know where you've approximately saved something, you don't need to search through the entire file system. You can just specify a path and then a name to the path. Uh, you can just specify a path. Hold on, I didn't show you how to do that with locate. Let me just do this. Uh, so locate file zero. And if I say home, Okay, so has it actually been able to find anything? Yep, there we go. So in addition to a ton load of stuff, which is basically your home directory, as it has taken that as a search pattern as well, it has actually managed to find this. But this is not what we're looking for. This is not good enough because it is taking the folder path as a search parameter. So it's giving us more results than we generally need. So this is no good. What we need is the help menu so dash dash help and we need to actually find a way to exclude the path to the file I'm sure it is here somewhere so let's take a look at it I'm approaching I'm, I'm I have an approach so that I am putting myself in your shoes and this is how you would do it if you wouldn't know how to do it in the first place this is how you would learn how to do it so basically what do we have here? You always go to the help and you figure out from there. We have A, what does that do? Only print entries that match all patterns. Nope, that's not really. Match only the, the base name of the path names. Hmm, this could be it. Only print number of found entries. Use database, only print entries. Nope, that, ignore for backward patterns. Are nope, let's just use the B option. So, dash dash, dash b, and let's go to home, and then space, and then file, I don't know, zero, we'll play around with it more. Excellent, so what have we gotten here? It says, it says in the, ups. <laughs> my mouse seems to be running away a little bit, it says b, base name, match only the base name of the path names, very simple. So it will just make it, it will just uh, go down to the it will just find the last entry and that will be it. Excellent. So within home folder and within all subdirectories of that folder, please look for anything any pattern that contains that contain uh, please find any file that contains this particular pattern which we have given it. So if you compare, let's say, this to this it's a lot shorter right you have significantly downsized the amount of possibilities very useful command people use it on a daily basis uh, just don't forget to update the database it is uh, necessary for you to do so if you want to find stuff because it is updated once a day and it's not enough you just need to update it manually and you will solve the problem. There are ways to configure it to update on a more frequent basis, but there is no need. You're just consuming resources. Rather, instead, just type in update DB and it's going to be done in milliseconds. Then find whatever it is that you are looking for without any problems whatsoever. Anyway, I bid you all farewell. Until next time. Welcome everybody to this tutorial. Today I will talk a bit about permissions, how you can change them, how you can read them, and what they are in general. So first off, 
let's just go ahead and open up a file. So don't worry about this command that I'm going to use now. It's called cat. Uh, I will explain it a bit later on when we go into text editing and phrasing and extracting text, formatting it in general, but for the time being just uh, leave it be. You'll see soon enough what it does. It just pulls the content out of a file and then prints it out to the screen. So I'm just gonna have, I have a file here, it's called mode, and in that file I have made a small demonstration of small, I wouldn't say demonstration, but an example of syntax of how this thing actually looks like. So you pass in the command, oops, so you pass in the command, which is chmod, which is chmod, and then where it says owner group world and path, path is basically path to the file of which you wish to change permissions, owner is changing the permissions for the owner, group is changing the permissions for the group, and world is basically changing the permissions for anybody who can physically access the computer. I will shortly explain what this actually is. So let's just let's go ls mode. There we go. So down below you have you see that the first uh, the, the first spot signifies what is it? Is it a directory or is it a file? Is it a link? That I've already explained. Next three fields basically tell you the permissions which this user has. So what the, what does the current what does the owner by the way this here this is the owner of the file. So what does this uh, what sort of permissions does this owner have? Uh, it has a read permission so it can read the file. It can see the contents of the file would be a more simpler way of putting it. It has a write permission so w this is basically a permission to edit and alter it and modify the file, change it. It does not have the permission to execute the file, although if I am the owner of the file, I can give myself the execute privileges as well. However, until I do so, I will not be able to execute it at all. I know that mode is not an ex uh, it does, there is nothing to execute in it, but still. Suppose there was a, there was a script here which was to be executed, and unless I actually gave it execution privileges, there would be no other way I could do this. Then uh, the next three spots signify permissions for this particular group. So any users belonging to this group will have these this set of permissions here. So again, the group can read, uh, it can modify it, but there are, no, there are no execution privileges for the group. Next up, it's the world. And by world, I don't mean the whole globe or anything of a kind. Rather, instead, I am referring to all the people who can actually log into the computer. Everybody can, re can read this file. Everybody can view the contents of this file without any problems. So let's just uh, go ahead and create a new file with touch. Just type in touch like this and t t how shall we name this file? Uh, t t t well, I don't know. I, I'm running out of inspirations here. So let's name this file Linux. Actually, no. Let's call it Red Hat. Excellent, so we've created Red Hat, and let's see what what are the permissions for Red Hat. Well, sorry, not the LS. Oh. Excellent, so we have the same set of permissions as we do with the mode. Now, let's say we're going to use this file in order to run our tests on it. Before we do, let's just go up a little bit and see what basic permissions do we have. So as I mentioned before, uh, have read, write, and execute. Those are the three basic basic permissions that you can give to a file, no, uh, to a user actually, or to a user group for a particular file. They have their numeric values. They have their, uh, they, you see these letters here, they also signify their values. They also, there are also representations of them, let's put it so. However, numeric values are far better. You can use R, W, and X plus minus in front 
to quickly alter the permissions for the owner of that file. However, if you wish to conduct major changes, you can do it in this fashion. So let's say that 7, it's basically 4 plus 2 plus 1, as stated here, is read, write, and execute. 6 would be 2 plus 4, which is read, write. 5 is 4 plus 1, so read, execute, and so on and so forth. And if this doesn't seem quite as clear as it should, don't worry about it. Uh, a lot of people got confused here. I got confused here. But it all really sinks in rather fast, so don't no need to panic or anything of a kind. Let's go ahead and clear the screen. I'm going to go ahead and cat this out. And let's say that I want to change the permissions of the file Red Hat. So let's do LL. Red Hat, just to see what, uh, just so that we have the overview of what they are at the moment. Now let's type as the upper syntax says we should. Let's go ahead and type in the command. So ch mod space. And what sort of permissions shall we give it? Well, let's first think about what sort of permissions do we want our user to have. Let's say that we don't want him to actually be able to change the file, but I want my owner of the file to be able to read it and execute it. Let's go ahead and conduct such a change. So read and execute would be 4 plus 1, that's 5. So the first argument is 5. That's what the owner of the file can do. Let's see what now, what sort of permissions do we want to give for the group? Uh, hmm. Well, I want the I want the group to be able to do the same thing actually. Let's not change anything here. We want it we want the group to be able to read it and to execute it. And the world, well, we're not going to really change anything for the world as uh yeah, read is way more than sufficient for the world, so let's just leave read as it is and give it 4. So it's chmod554 that I have typed in, space, and then I type in the name of the file. Also, notice that here it says path. Since I am in the, in the same directory where the file that I wish to modify is located, I could also, if I wasn't, if I was elsewhere in the file, in the file system, I could type in, I don't know, I could go about things like this. So home, random guy, Red Hat, and this would change it for home random guy Red Hat. Hello. Excellent. So you see, uh, you can compare the previous permissions to the current permissions. You see that this has immediately changed. It says uh, that the user can read and execute, the group can read and execute, the world can only read. Suppose I want to quickly add a write to my to the owner of the group. I would do ch mod without any calculations of whatsoever or looking at the numbers or anything of a kind. Just type in ch mod plus x and here we're gonna need the name of the file, red hat. Let's see what we have done. Oh, actually, we haven't done anything because it. Oh, oh, sorry, because it already has execute privileges. Sorry, I'm gonna add write privileges. That's what I wanted to do. Excellent. So, how does this look like now? So, uh, the user can actually write, read, write, and execute. So here it can read, not write, and execute. And now we have changed effectively for the group as well the group now can actually read, write, and execute. And here, read, write, and, uh, sorry, up here it's read, no writes, and execute, but it's here, it's read, write, and execute. Okay, uh, we have changed our minds. We no longer wish to give the write permissions. Let's say chmod minus w. What has happened? The w is gone, as you can clearly see. So these are the quick ways of changing uh, the owner and the group to which the file 
that owns the file as well. Initially I just said uh, the owner, but it's actually the group as well in this particular example. Anyway, there are other things which we can do. Let's say, let's just go ahead and clear the screen with this and type in ch mod space dash dash help. So what do we have here? Uh, this is probably the dash v and dash r are probably the, mo the ones most important here, the one that you will mostly tend to use. So verbose output is just to tell you what it is that it is doing and recursive well, just read what it does. Change files and directories recursively. So it just goes into the subdirectories of directories and then it goes into their subdirectories and then it finds files there and then it does alteration on the whole string. Here, let me just uh, show you. So we're not gonna... Uh, let's see, what do we got here first? Do we have anything of no importance? T -t 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 so we got mode, we got red hat, mm, come on, something, apparently, okay, we, ha oh, I do have a test folder, let's utilize the test folder, let's see what it actually has to say on the subject. So what do we do? We type in, oh wait, do I have anything in the test folder? Oops, let's just go ahead and check. If we don't, we just need to create. Okay, so we can go ahead and create with touch. Test one, test two, test three. Let's go back a step. Do ch mod. Oops, I actually don't know what they are first. So ll test folder. Excellent. So they all have read write and no execute privileges. Let's let's change it to execute privileges. Let's give execute privileges, but if we print the working directory, we're not actually in the test folder at all, rather instead we are outside of it. So how do we do go about this? Well, just type in ch mod as you would ordinarily, type in dash r space plus x space, and now we need a path to the file, which is basically test folder and then change everything inside of it. Excellent. So let's go ahead. Voila. There you go. So compare, you can now compare these results to these results. It has changed everything within that folder and it has given it these permissions. But when you do it like this, you see that the world changes as well. Uh, the group changes as well and the current user changes as well. So all the permissions are changed, which is uh, not the best of practices. What you can do with ease to avoid this is simply type in ch mod r and then use numbers as I have used them before. In that way you can be absolutely certain what changes will take effect and what will be changed to what, who will be able to do what etc. Anyway, here I'm gonna call the tutorial, I'm gonna bid you farewell and I'll hope and I sincerely hope that I shall see you in the next one. Welcome back everybody, today I am going to go ahead and instruct you, I will show you how to change the ownership of the file from one user to another or from one group to another. Anyway, I have already explain that this first part is actually the username of the user who owns the file and this is actually the name of the group that owns the file as well to which the file belongs. Anyway, these things you will frequently need to change. Well, not in this well, later on in this particular system we will do this in more detail. Uh, we will mention it more, but there is really nothing that there is really nothing to it. Uh, we will mention it when we get into user creation and user management. But for the time being, I mean, the principle will remain the same. There is nothing fundamentally different that I will do with this particular command. It's very similar to ch, uh, ch mod. If I type in ch mod, this one is simply ch own. So who owns a particular file 
somewhere or a set of files. Here, if I just show you the dash dash help menu, oops, come on. At the very top, you can see usage. So it's ch own, then the owner, the group, and then the file. Keep in mind that this file can actually be a path to a file, not the doesn't need to be necessarily the file itself, rather instead it can be the path. So you can change the ownership from anywhere on the system without any sort of problems of whatsoever. Uh, verbose is also not bad to use. That can give you a bit of extra information. And down here, I'm sure that we have recursive. Excellent. So we have also recursive uh, operator files and directories recursively. This is pretty much the same as in CH. Uh, mod primarily because it does the same thing for every uh, for the subfolders and the files within those folders no problem okay so there are some other there's some there's this one which is very nice as well it says change the owner and or group of each file only if its current owner and or group match these specific uh, yeah, it says something out there. Specif match those specified here, I guess. I'm missing one letter there, but doesn't matter. Either may be omitted, in which case a match is not required for the omitted attribute. So this is very nice if you want to like, do changes on particular things and leave other things untouched. But generally, what you will be using is a very simple version of the command, one of the most used arguments here will of course be verbose and recursive you can also get the version text if you want the general also one more one more of those general things dash dash version and this is pretty much unique uh, I wouldn't say in same but generally the same for all the programs out there running in Linux that you can operate in terminal very important thing this version primarily because if you have a bug if something's not working out you need to go out onto the net and see solutions related to your particular version and not to something else anyway let's just go ahead and see how this works so let's ll test excellent so test is owned by random guy and by group random guy i need to change the root because the only other group the only other user that I have on the system is actually root. So su, well, technically not that correct, but I have root and I have random guy. Uh, test. Although I do have other user groups, primarily because the system generates them as well. Anyway, let's just go ahead and type in ch own and I say root and then I say file so test one two three press enter if I type in ll test one two three there we go you can see that no longer is the random guy the owner of this file rather instead now root is the owner of this file but wait we still have the group so whatever whatever rules apply uh, here to the group, pretty much anybody belonging to this group will have the same permissions as the group for this particular file. So we do need to change that as well. We need to type in ch own and look, now you need to type in root, then the name of your group, but first semi, first colon. And then type in the name of the group, which is basically root for root, space, name of the file, test, one, two, three, press enter, simple as that, you get the result, and I type in ll, test, one, two, three, and there we go. Now I have successfully changed the ownership of a file uh, to the user group, to the user root, and to the group root as well. Sorry, I got confused there a little bit. Anyway, this functions in the same way uh, that the ch mod, mod does. So you can just pass in the arguments here. R or I don't know. Let's try. Let's. Try, I've already showed you the R. Let's try with the verbose thing. Excellent. So nothing has changed. It says ownership of 
test one two three retained as root root. Hmm. Okay. Let's uh, let's play around with it. Let's see what's gonna say next. But first, uh, let's just clear the screen a little bit. Okay. So ch own. Now I shall show you something. So ah, never mind. Actually, we could do it like this, and then we're gonna do the ch own thing. Excellent. So here we go. Let's delete this and type in random guy colon random guy. Excellent. And now we want to pass in the argument verbose. So it actually tells us what it is doing. I mean, for just one file like this, sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. Most of the time it wouldn't. But when you have, I don't know, like 50 files, something like that, you definitely want to have that verbose output. I mean, you're not going to skim through every single one of those lines, but you know, is they're going to be keep popping. They're going to keep popping in your terminal, and you're going to be keep. And you're going to be looking at them, and they'll generally be this exactly the same lines. If there's an anomaly somewhere, you, I mean, 90% of the time, there is some sort of a problem there. So let's say that this. I press this. It says changed ownership of test one two three from root. Uh, user to and root group to random guy and random guy very simple and if I type in LL test one two three press enter once again you can see that we have managed to successfully change from root root to random guy random guy you can have pretty much as many groups or as many users as you wish as many as your system can physically support and these uh, these, these sort of information can be seen in a file. So how many users you have, which users you have, how are they configured, how many groups do you have, etc. But those things are found in the in Etsy, in PassWD and Etsy Shadow. We're not going to do that for the time being. If I show you the files, they would mainly serve the purpose of confusion because there is a lot of stuff there aside from the usernames. Uh, but I don't want you to worry about it. We will deal with it in due time. For the time being, I just want you to know that there is a file that lists all the users and there is another one which lists all the groups without any problems of whatsoever. Anyway, I would like to bid you all farewell and I sincerely hope that I shall see you in the follow-up tutorial. Welcome all to this tutorial. Today I'm just going to first go ahead and clear the screen and afterwards we will deal with a couple of commands. Uh, three of them to be exact. So we'll, we'll have RM, we will have move, and we will have CP for copying. Anyway, let's just go over them. Uh, the first one, well, RM is always nice, and RM is basically used to delete files, delete folders, delete pretty much anything you wish to delete. However, you should keep in mind that this is not like deleting in Windows. Once you delete them with RM, it is not very likely that you will get them back, or you could get them back, but you would need to invest a ridiculous amount of effort into actually doing it. And still, it would be rather questionable. So keep that in mind when using RM, especially when passing certain arguments to it, which cause it to skip verification or something of a kind and you delete a folder like full of things, but you can't always do that. Here's why. Uh, you can't delete a folder full of things unless you specify, unless you pass certain arguments to the RM command. This is a precautionary measure, to say the least. So I have test folder, which has certain files in it. And if I say RM test folder, it's going to tell me immediately, cannot remove test folder, it is a directory. Well, what seems to be the problem there? So what? I know that it's a directory, I want to delete it. And it might seem strange to you, but you can't just delete folders just like that, primarily because once you do, they're gone. The good, the good place to look is, of course, the help page, and we are looking for the F command, dash F. So we, of course, as with all others, have recursiveness. And if you want your commands to be recursive to, I don't know, if they perform a certain operation on a directory or in a file or something of a kind, uh, recursive generally means, as I've stated before, that they do it on their subfolders and then they do it in the, onto the uh, then they do it to the files within those subfolders, whatever it is that the 
command does. So dash dash lowercase r or dash uppercase r or dash dash recursive. I purely doubt that anybody actually uses this dash dash recursive. Usually it's dash capital R dash lowercase r. These are, these things are universal pretty much. Any command that has recursive abilities will actually have these two arguments pretty much embedded into it. Anyway, if we move upwards and there we go. We have four here. In ignore non-existent files and arguments, never prompt at all. So it will never ask you any questions. It's just gonna go through it and it's gonna remove things, clear them rather fast, which is not a very good thing. Uh, well, it is efficient in a delete in the sense of deleting files, but it's not a very good thing in the sense of recovery. Anyway, we will use the recursive and the force function today. So in order for you to delete, to delete a directory, uh, you would need to delete its contents. So rm-rf-test. Voila, there you go. It is gone. LL, uh, the test folder is no longer here. You cannot see it. You cannot find it. It is gone, permanently gone. Yeah, too bad. What can you really do about it? Anyway, be rather careful when using rm command. Uh, you can delete regular files with rm. Uh, let's see what. So test one, two, three. No additional arguments are needed, but like this, it's going to prompt you for. Uh, it's going to actually prompt you and it's going to say rm remove regular empty file test one, two, three. Do you want to do this or not? If you do, you type in y. If you're not, then you type in n. So let's say that I am. And if I do ll again, it's gone. Completely gone. So let's try one more thing. Uh, let's try to delete the file called Red Hat. And we're going to do that uh, by telling RM not to ask us any questions. So Red Hat. And if I say dash f, press enter. You see, this is just going to remove the folder. Uh, this is just going to remove the file without any problems of whatsoever. But the same kit, the same applies as with the folder. It's not going to ask us any questions. It's not going to care. You've told it not to care and it will just go about things, deleting them, which can be, uh, which is uh, pretty, pretty, pretty bad. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and clear the screen. We have two more two more commands to process, which is basically cp, that is copy. And here's how it works. Uh, from and then to. You type in cp, you type in the path to, your, to the file that you wish to copy, and then you type in the path uh, destination, so source and destination. From would be the source, to would be the destination. Simple as that. Let's just go ahead and take a look at the cp help. So help. Oh my, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of things here. Anyway, what, what are we looking for? Sure, we got verbose, but we're not really uh, interested. Well, we're going to use for, as I said before, for smaller amounts of files, it's not that important, but when you got 50 or 100 or 200 or 10,000, not a bad idea to have this turned on. Well, maybe not for 10,000, because you're not going to be able to look at them all. But let's say for 50, for 100 or something of a kind, it's not a bad thing. Anyway, what are we looking for here? And there we go. You see this recurring subject, this recurring theme with recursiveness. It's dash r, dash r. I'm just trying to make a point that other commands are also similar in terms of arguments. So if you've got one set of arguments that you're passing to one command and they have a certain markation, they have a certain letter of the keyboard reserved for them with a dash, it is very likely that those things are general and that they are used in other, in other places as well. So let's just uh, continue looking through here. Again, you have the force command. You see, it's uh, 
it's pretty much this, it's the same. Uh, there is the same description as well. You can read through it. Forgive me if I'm mistaken here, but I am 99.99 sure that this is exactly the same description as well. Feel free to look at it. I'm sure you won't get disappointed there. Anyway, we got a D. Nope, don't care about that for the time being. Archive attributes, etc. Anyway, the only good option here uh, for me is the force, and if you you can use force with CP far more often than you should with RM, primarily because you're not going to mess anything up. So what? You're just going to copy files from one place to another. They'll still be there. They're not gone anywhere. They they can't get legs and walk out of your system. So no problems there. Anyway, let's just go ahead and try to copy something. Hello, what we got here? We've got file zero one. So type in. Oops, let's let's do this. So clear. LLCP file zero one. Also, also what is very much applicable is dash home. I'm just specifying. I'm just giving an example of a path. This can be typed in so many different ways for home, but uh, no, okay, random guy, file, ah, file 01. I would like you to copy this to the downloads folder. So go to downloads, and there you go, nothing too complex, and nothing out of, out, out of the scope of understanding, I would say, just CP one path, and then another path, space, and then another path, simple as that, press enter, and there you go, it has indeed copied it there, it remains here, but let's go to, well, we don't actually need to go anywhere, we can just type in LL downloads. And surely enough, you can see it there, it's the first, it's the very first entry. File, zero, one, no problems, it is there. Anyway, let's just go ahead and clear this. There's also another command which you can use, which is move. Move is also a way of renaming things. So let's say that I have uh, file 01. I would like to rename it to file 0001. So file. Actually, I would like to rename it to something better. Uh, I am here. Okay. think that should do it. And if I press enter, there are no new paths specified. We're only using the current working directory, which means uh, that we have indeed just renamed something. Doesn't need to be the case, but here in this demonstration, I didn't actually move anything. I just renamed something. I just renamed file 01 into I am here. Not a big deal. Uh, that's how you change names in Linux terminal. Very nice unless you actually open up something and save it with another command. Anyway, where it says file one, you can have a path to anywhere in the system where